so um, the class tonight, what is neoliberalism? Everyone got a packet so you can follow along. It has some of the data and all of that in there. Um, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to do one section, and then we're going to, it's open discussion for a little while, and then we'll do the next section and open discussion, and then the next section and open discussion. Anyone can say whatever they want, you know, and it's just kind of a conversation. So um, norm, a lot of times when I speak, I try to give like very inflammatory, fiery, passionate speeches. I'm not doing that tonight. This is more of an informational point. Uh, just kind of lay out the facts there, and people can say whatever they want about them. And so we have four sections. Uh, the first section, section one, the roots of anti-humanism. But I wanted to begin uh, by saying, you know, my encounter with neoliberalism, I encountered it when I was about 12 years old, I think. And I went to Ecuador in the year of 1999. And I was 12 years old, and I went with my father to Ecuador. My father was leading a nature tour in the Galapagos Islands. That was you know, kind of a job he had. And so we, we flew into Ecuador, and uh, I remember we got off the plane. And we walked out of the airport and we just saw just miles of desperately poor, starving people. And I was 12 years old, I'd grown up in a small town in Ohio, I had never seen that level of poverty before. And I was blown away, I just was like, what is going on here? And there were just, you know, children, all these people that were gathering outside the airport. And I, I later learned what was going on was that they had just switched to the dollar as their currency. Um, and that there had been a huge amount of uh, rural Ecuadorians had been forced off their land, and this was all you know, part of the IMF and the World Bank's uh, program in Ecuador. And if I had gone to Ecuador 10 years prior to that, it wouldn't have been that bad. There would have been a lot of poverty, but it wouldn't have been anywhere near that level. And if I had gone to Ecuador, and I did go back to Ecuador in 2013, and I saw a completely different country. Uh, a country that had been just completely rebuilt with new highways. I didn't, I didn't see a single homeless person the entire time I was there in Ecuador in 2013. So that's how I directly encountered neoliberalism, I guess you could say. And that's what I was seeing in Ecuador was the effects of neoliberalism. And what we're seeing in the world today, I would say, is more than anything the aftermath and the reaction to neoliberalism. So tonight we're going to talk about what neoliberalism actually is. It's a word that gets thrown around, around a lot, and I think you know it's a word that a lot of people don't really know what it means, and that a lot of the conversation around it is a little bit highfalutin, um, but I feel like we should talk about it just in kind of a basic sense. So, section one, uh, roots of anti-humanism. Now, what I'm talking about in this section is not neoliberalism. This is, this is things that influenced it, things that kind of laid the basis for it. So first of all, liberalism. You know, when people talk about neoliberalism, I think a lot of people use it, you know, like, like you know, there's liberals that are Democrats, there's conservatives that are Republicans, there's neoconservatives, neoliberals. That's not the correct use of the term. Neoliberalism is an economic term. And it goes back to the roots of what liberalism actually meant when it originated as a word, which is at the time that feudalism was being toppled and the new system of capitalism was coming in, a new philosophy and a new understanding of the world rooted in the Enlightenment emerged, and it was about emphasizing the individual, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the rights of man, life, liberty, and property, John Locke, uh, individualism, human rights. This was the philosophy that emerged, and this is really the philosophy that now dominates the world, is liberalism. You call it liberalism, the belief in the individual. And economic liberalism is the belief in free markets, or in the belief in capitalism. Social liberalism is the belief that people have the right to live their own life the way they want to and not be messed with by the government. So it's very different than the kind of this, the standard way we use it now, which is Democrats are liberals, Republicans are conservatives. In, in the sense of neoliberalism, economic liberalism refers to free markets. That's, that's what liberalism and neoliberalism means. Um, so, you know, you have Adam Smith um, in his book, The Wealth of Nations, um, and he talks about free trade and how you have the invisible hand that uh, supply and demand, you know, just basic economics, you know, modern capitalist thinking emerges. Then later you have an English philosopher, and uh, he emerges, he's more of an economist, Robert Thomas Malthus. And Malthus comes up with this theory that he argues that essentially uh, that the population grows faster than the food supply. And he argues that that's why the French Revolution happened, right? Is that the, the, you know, there were just, you know, the food supply had grown, uh, you know, had, had not grown, the population was growing, there were too many people, and this caused, you know, the French Revolution. And that all the unrest that was taking place in Europe around that time, and this was a, a time of great turmoil, you know, the old feudal monarchies were being overturned, people were rising up and creating modern nation states. He argues that this is all because of a term he coined called overpopulation, right? There's just too many people in the world, the food supply is down. 
And so then you have Charles Darwin, the famous biologist, who was actually a follower of Malthus. And you know, his, his biology, biological theories are largely correct and widely appreciated and celebrated in the world today. Um, but people look at Charles Darwin's work and they see that in some ways, even modern biologists are critical of it because you know, he's arguing for natural selection, right? That you know, responding to their environments, life gradually changes over time. But if you read like his book, for example, The Descent of Man, uh, he talks about human beings as if they are kind of the pinnacle of evolution, like all of the history of life is just gradually escalating to get to human beings. And so immediately, you have people who take Charles Darwin's ideas, uh, people that you would call social Darwinists, and they really cling to the phrase survival of the fittest. And they start arguing that, you know, for example, the British Empire, it was right for them to conquer the world because they're, they're the fittest, they're the most powerful, and, you know, it's, it's right for them to to exterminate other people and, and the, their actions, you know, you know, free markets and capitalism are great because the, you know, the fittest and the best survive and the others don't. And so that was kind of laying the basis. Now, John D. Rockefeller, who's the founder of Standard Oil and is actually the richest American of all time, he was part of a society that were called Neo-Malthusians. And they were looking and in the aftermath of the Industrial Revolution, you have the rise of socialism and Marxism, you have strikes and protests that are taking place. And John D. Rockefeller and the Neo-Malthusians, they, they argue that, again, the problem is there's just too many people in the world. There's too many people in the world, there's all these desperately poor people out there, and uh, that's why they're protesting and demanding their rights and food, and we need to do something about overpopulation. So then there's the famous incident, the Ludlaw Massacre, uh, 1914. And so essentially, this is in Colorado, uh, there's a group of miners, and they are, you know, they're on strike demanding better wages, and they live in homes that are owned by the company, right? And they don't get paid in money, they get paid in, you know, script that's only usable at the company store, right? And they're in awful conditions. So they go on strike, and so they're immediately kicked out of their homes. And so they set up an encampment someplace, uh, you, know, you know, as they're kicked out of their homes. John D. Rockefeller sends company guards and the National Guard. They open fire with machine guns into this, this tent city and just slaughter all these people. Uh, it's a horrendous incident. Uh, 20 people are killed, many more injured, you know, children. Just a horrendous incident. So then, interestingly, that brings you to Margaret Sanger. Now, Margaret Sanger was a, a socialist, uh, a Marxist revolutionary living here in New York City. Um, and she, uh, you know, she really believed in birth control and women's reproductive rights. That was the issue that she very, very strongly believed in. Um, and, but she was a socialist and a Marxist. She was actually on the committee of the Socialist Party of New York City. She was a, a funder financially of the industrial workers of the world. Um, and she heard about John D. Rockefeller's horrendous Ludlaw massacre, and she then printed in her newspaper, The Rebel Woman, a, a call for someone to assassinate John D. Rockefeller. And she was also sending birth control through the mail, which at that point was illegal, and she was facing criminal charges. So she fled from the United States uh, because she was facing all these criminal charges. And she was in Britain, and in Britain she started associating with the Neo-Malthusians. And the Neo-Malthusians uh, were arguing that there's too many people in the world, and they thought what she was doing with trying to get birth control legalized was a very, very good thing. Uh, because they said, look, you know, you know, there's too many people in the world, and even though she was a Marxist, and gradually she started to move away from Marxism, and she didn't particularly care for the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union came into existence, you know, at the beginning the Soviet Union had been very socially liberal and, you know, had been talking about free love and, and such, but as the Soviet Union became more socially conservative and was promoting what they called the Soviet family and, you know, had a traditional, a traditional gender roles and, and all of that, she didn't particularly care for the Soviet Union. But she did come back to the United States, and then she set up uh, what was the, the first birth control clinic in the United States. It was in Brownsville in Brooklyn. And actually, John D. Rockefeller, who she had, had called for you know, killing in her newspaper and fled the United States, ended up paying for it. Um, and that was the first birth control clinic. And then she started writing, and as she wrote about birth control, uh, for example, uh, she began to write about the, the cruelty of charity. And she began to argue that feeding you know, low-income people was a problem because then they'll have more children. There's too many of them. Um, and she also began openly and blatantly pre preaching racism. She spoke at Ku Klux Klan meetings. Um, and actually, on the next page, I wanted to, this is a direct quote from, from one of her writings. Um, she says, birth control is not just contraception indiscriminately and thoughtlessly practiced. It is a means to release the cultivation of better racial elements in our society and gradually the suppression, elimination, and eventual extemporation of the defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming and finest flowers of American civilization. So she's basically arguing for eugenics, you know, that we're going to wipe out races we deem to be inferior. Um, 
Now, I think it's pretty clear that Margaret Sanger believed in birth control because she believed in women's rights. However, she made an alliance with people who believed in birth control for very, very different reasons than she did. Um, so that brings me, of course, to Adolf Hitler. Now, Adolf Hitler was the leader of the Nazi party in Germany, and the main <coughs> argument of the Nazi party was they argued that all these protests and uprisings and strikes that were happening during the Great Depression, they were all caused by a genetic defect in Jews. Uh, that was the basis of their anti-Semitism. There is this, there is this de genetic defect in Jews that they're always causing problems and leading that. Um, and that was the basis for their eventual, you know, you know, horrendous, you know, slaughter of 17 million people, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and others, in gas chambers. It was this belief that they were going to end the uprisings and protests and restore some kind of ancient, you know, glorious ancient civilization by exterminating people in mass. And this poster um, that I think is very important, um, this is a poster from Nazi Germany, because the first people that they began exterminating were, uh, were the disabled. Now, you read this poster, uh, it has the picture of a man who's disabled, and it said, this person is suffering from hereditary defects, cost the community this certain amount of money, fellow German, this is your money too. And basically arguing that, that the disabled community needed to be exterminated because they were costing too much, you know, they were, they were an expense on society, why should we feed them? And the term that was used was useless eater. And that was the term that they used for people they deemed to be, you know, not good for society. Why are we feeding the useless eaters? We ought to just exterminate them. Um, and that was a big point in Nazism. However, after the Second World War, you know, you had what you could call the Keynesian consensus. Um, at that point, uh, you know, there was a feeling that, that in the lead up to the Second World War, we'd have the Great Depression. You know, people were starving and hungry, massive strikes and protests, mass unemployment and hunger. And there was, you know, John Maynard Keynes, the British uh, economist, his philosophy was basically that the government should take action to make the economy work better. That he's, instead of saying what Marxists said, Marxists said the problem is overproduction, he said the issue was underconsumption, right? That, that people just, you know, with their wages being low, they don't have the ability to spend. So people illustrate Keynesian economics by saying, okay, so say you, the government hires somebody to go out and dig, dig a hole in the ground and then fill it back in. Somebody might look at that and say that's a waste of money. But that guy, he's getting paid a wage to dig the hole and then fill it back in. He then has spending money, and he goes and spends that money, and that builds the, that builds the economy, right? And there was a feeling that the government should spend money to stimulate the economy, and that's the basis of Keynesian economics. And John Maynard Keynes was very much, I mean, he was not a Marxist whatsoever. He was very much a believer in capitalism and all that, but he believed that the state, you know, should intervene to, to try and stimulate the economy. And, this is kind of, this is all kind of the background, these ideas that, that lay the basis for what we're getting to in the next section, which is the ideology and the emergence of neoliberalism. So that's section one, so let's have some conversation. Uh, it's a very important distinction going over the origins of liberalism, because now, especially in the United States and uh, maybe a few other uh, Western European countries, there's a big misconception about liberalism as if it's somehow inherently uh, connected with progressivism or socialism or something like that, but in reality its origins are uh, socialism and progressivism are basically uh, um, a response against liberalism. So that, and I think that's a really important thing that uh, we need to emphasize in the United States, uh, the origins of liberalism and what it really is. No one, no one has to say it, but if you want to, you can just say it, it's fine. I want everyone to have an opportunity to speak. Uh, briefly, I just think it's important to note that Keynesianism, you know, as said by Keynes himself, was an attempt to, quote, save capitalism from itself. Um, because I feel like a lot of people, especially conservatives, you know, see Keynesianism as a gateway to communism or a gateway to Marxism, and that's obviously not true. Keynes was a huge you know, capitalist, and his entire premise was that the government should take action in order to save capitalism from itself. Um, yeah, just a point I wanted to make. Uh, the thing about Keynes, I just learned, is that the intro to his book, um, uh, he says that his policies were best implemented under a totalitarian state, that is, mm. Nazi Germany. So he was validly fascist. And now there's a discussion of uh, bringing back Keynesianism. And it's bad because people don't understand that, yeah, Keynes actually represented, you know, a, a fascist policy and people trying to do, you know, it's called the New Bretton Woods. They're actually doing a fake British, you know, global policy, which is a fashion policy instead of one that was, you know, Franklin Roosevelt. Yes, 
Yes, uh, a lot of people also fetishize uh, Darwinism as um, being the natural order. For um, with our social Darwinism, actually, um, it actually started as a bastardization of, Charl of Charles Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest, meaning survival of the strongest. However, they meet what they people fail to um, forget is that survival of the fittest doesn't mean someone who's the most powerful or the most or the strongest. It just means you know who, someone who's able to adapt to an environment, and that also includes you know so uh, more social progressive um, ideas as well. And um, and I think it's more. I guess I, a true Darwinist, you know, if you become more progressive, you know, in a in a society that starts to reject capitalism. I think it's important that, um, especially with uh, yeah, Nazi Germany, that we go into their economic system because um, Hitler came to power because the center right and the far right uh, wanted to unite and uh, find some way to combat the emerging communist and socialist forces. Uh, Franz von Papen, who actually held the chancellor position prior to Hitler. Like out, like boosted him into power, and the word privatization was actually coined by multiple newspapers to describe the Nazi economies, uh, the the uh, Nazi Germany's economic um, mo mo moves. Because what they ended up doing was they actually privatized all 14 state-owned firms that were nationalized under the Weimar Republic. And then people say that was the Weimar Republic socialist? Well, no, because they were also the first state to implement welfare, but they were also the first state to implement anti-socialist law. Um, so I think it's important because, you know, the Nazi Germany and their party was called the National Socialist German Workers Party, but um, the left wing of that party was ousted and, uh, you know, completely purged. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 some people tend to call the, the Nazi Germany the national capitalist instead of national socialist, they ended up being. That's pretty much it. Well, there were some things about, and I'll, I'll say this before we go to section two, unless anyone else wants to, to come in, but, um, you know, about what you were saying, Rachel, there were some things about Nazi Germany that were very Keynesian, I, I would say. Hallemer Schacht was the economist uh, that the Nazi government worked with, and one of his big, you know, things was the was he built the autobahns, actually, which were these, these highways that and it was a big government program, hire lots of people, have them building it. And a lot of people describe the current U.S. economy as military Keynesianism. Um, instead of spending, you know, Keynesianism on just, you know, hiring people to build infrastructure, instead they're hiring people instead to, you know, use they use military spending to stimulate the economy, and that's very widespread. As people say the U.S. is military Keynesianism, and apparently Keynes did have some, you know, a very significant role in advising uh, U.S. economists in the aftermath of the Second World War, and so. It, you know, it's that may be very intentional. The military Keynesianism may be very intentional. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, I, I wanted to throw that out there. But yeah. Anyone else? Oh, sure. Uh, I guess one thing I'm, I'm wondering, um, I guess, is uh, if, um, yeah, I guess the the whole uh, like ignoring the you know the thing that obviously always gets focused on in uh, uh, with the, what the Nazis did to the to the Jews, but like this this whole attitude towards useless eaters. Uh, I guess I'm wondering uh, if um, if capitalism basically ultimately leads you to that. Um, like if, if that's oh like what did you say? Why would I say so? No, I said I wouldn't say that. Oh, well, because I'm, I'm just thinking because it's like, uh, like pure capitalist would be like, you wouldn't help someone like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. And so uh, I'm just wondering if like that's, you know, kind of like, if you follow that, like the, the train of capitalist thought, like far enough do you get to useless eaters? I don't know. I, 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 you know, Keynesianism is certainly capitalism, and that's, you know, that's, you know, they don't have that attitude. There's a lot of capitalist welfare states in the world that exist. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily where that leads, um, you know. Um, and the other thing is that, I mean, I will make the point that as much as this class is on neoliberalism, you know, the Nazis were not adherents of neoliberalism. I mean, they, they very much believed that the government should have a role in the economy. They were very much, military spending was a huge part of it. Schack was, you know, the advisor and he was calling. They did have, there was government intervention in the economy, um, you know, that, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, so that's I just included these as influences. So that's so. Shall we go to the next section? All righty. So in the lead up to the Second World War in Europe, 
you know, basically you have the far left, social democracy and communism, you have the emergence of, you know, various fascist and far right schools. There's one grouping that advocates, you know, laissez-faire free markets, and it's what people call the Austrian school. Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, Murray Rothbard, and they argue that you should keep the economy, the classical Gilded Age, keep everything privatized, free markets, that's what they're for. Now, oddly though, they seem sympathetic to the fascist forces, even though the fascist forces don't agree with their free market perspective. Um, and I actually, Ludwig von Mises, when, when Mussolini was in power, he writes this essay basically saying that he thinks that, uh, that, that you know, the fascist governments that were emerging were necessary to fight communism. Right? That communism is the greatest threat, communism is the greatest evil, so Mussolini, you know, he may be, you know, having heavy government involvement and all that, but at least he's killing a lot of communists, right? At least he's, he's killing communists. And that seems to be the attitude that the Austrian school has. They don't approve of, of Nazi economic policies. They don't approve of fascist economic policies, but at least they kill communists, right? And they're preserving Europe. They're protecting Europe from the, the red menace, right? That's, that's kind of their argument. Um, so then, now, we come to an individual by the name of Ayn Rand. Now, Ayn Rand was born in the, you know, in Russia, and her father was a chemist and a, a business owner, and their property was seized during the Russian Revolution, um, and she felt like this was a huge, you know, a huge imposition on her family and their rights. Um, she was very, very opposed to the, the socialist government that emerged in the Soviet Union. Um, so she got a degree in cinematography from a Soviet university, and I will add that that was a free, you know, she got a free degree in cinematography, and that was a great place to study cinematography at the time. That was Sergei Eisenstein, the guy who invented the montage, you know, and, and Soviet Union, despite being a very, very poor country at that point, that was before the five-year plans, they actually had a very, very vibrant uh, cinema, um, and that uh, they were, you know, they were having some great breakthroughs in, in film. She got a degree uh, in cinematography, and then she moved to Chicago. And she moved in with her family members in Chicago. She fled the Soviet Union. She came, she supposedly came to the United States to finish her, to continue her education in cinematography, but she was just fleeing. It was a fake visa. And she, she came, she lived in Chicago with her family. And at the time in Chicago, there was a man named William Hickman. And he had strangled his wife to death. Um, and uh, the judge said to William Hickman, if you will show some remorse, if you will apologize for murdering your wife, uh, we will not give you the death penalty. And William Hickman said he had no regrets for strangling his wife and was given the death penalty. Ayn Rand fell in love with William Hickman and had pictures of her, uh, pictures of him, and she just thought he was the greatest man. Um, and it's, it's quite strange. She then moved on. She went to Hollywood with her degree in cinematography. She worked in the offices of screenwriters, and she wrote a novel that was published in 1943. Um, and it was called The Fountainhead. And it tells the story of a, of a kind of a non-conforming architect named Howard Rourke. Um, and Howard Rourke, he designs buildings in ways that are just unconventional and non-conforming. Um, and so he's persecuted and all of this. And, you know, at one point in the novel, The Fountainhead, Howard Rourke actually breaks into the apartment of a woman and violently rapes her. Um, and Ayn Rand's narration portrays this as a heroic act, as this is a man asserting his will, and, and it's, it's quite extreme. Now later, you know, but The Fountainhead, she was pretty obscure. She wasn't very well known. Uh, but then, when the House on American Activities Committee began, she had worked in this screenwriting office, so she knew all these writers who had been associated with the Communist Party. So she became a friendly witness to the House on American Activities Committee, testifying about how much influence the Communist Party had in Hollywood. And she immediately became like a celebrity. And her book, Atlas Shrugged, was published. It's a book that tells the story of uh, rich men going on strike uh, because, uh, because the world doesn't appreciate their greatness and they have to pay too many taxes. So the rich people all go on strike. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and she starts, you know, she's, her philosophy is objectivism. And, um, you know, uh, one, one line from her book, Atlas Shrugged, she says, money is the source of all good in the world, um, you know, kind of playing on. And she's an atheist. Uh, I, I, unlike most conservatives at the time, she's an atheist. And she says that religion is bad because it encourages people to be compassionate. And she says that altruism, compassion, and empathy are the greatest human defects. And that, you know, if you, you know, that people caring about each other, this is weakness. People should just be purely, uh, purely self-interested. Um, and one of the people who starts working with her uh, is a guy named Alan Greenspan. 
a uh, young student named Alan Greenspan, just kind of falls in love with Ayn Rand, becomes very, very close to her. She builds kind of an inner circle. Uh, there's a psychologist named Nathaniel Braden, um, and they, they form kind of this inner circle, and they jokingly call it the collective, uh, even though they're against all collectivism. And they, you know, Ayn Rand, you know, shoots up, uh, you know, amphetamines and gives these very, very exciting lectures about how, about how no one should have compassion and about how selfishness is the point of all good. Um, there's a famous, there's an essay by Leon Trotsky where he says Marxism is that A can never equal A because, you know, the first A in no way can never be identical to the second A, showing that the universe is always in motion. She says that her philosophy of objectivism is instead that A always equals A, and all that exists is, is simply matter, and she's, she's trying to counter Marxism, and if you read it, her, her, her novels are written in a way, it's inspired by socialist realism. And, and Marxism, and she's trying to make pro-capitalist propaganda inspired by the Marxist propaganda coming out of the Soviet Union. Um, and she's, you know, her novel Atlas Shrugged is about, you know, I mean, the figure Atlas who held up the world, and, and she's, she's doing that. Now, later in the 1970s, she starts to get funding from the Ford Foundation. Um, and the Ford Foundation starts promoting her, and, and she gives a lecture in 1972 at Ford Hall Forum. Um, and she actually greatly offends her audience, because a lot of her audience are young 1960s libertarians who are attracted to her ideas about, you know, wanting free love and, you know, freedom and not having the government interfere. But in the lecture, she, she calls, she says the military draft is absolutely necessary, uh, because she says if you don't, if you won't fight against the communists, you should have no right to enjoy our free society. Um, she then goes on to say that the Native Americans deserved to be killed. And she said if they didn't do anything with the soil of the United States, they didn't have the right. They shouldn't have the right to keep it, and they deserved to be killed. And then she says the same for the Palestinians, right? She says, look, you know, the Arabs, you know, they do nothing with their soil, so the Israelis come there and, and kill them and, and start building. That's good. That's progress. She says that actually Israel is the first political cause she ever donated money to. Uh, interestingly, um, now you know, people might think this is just an obscure intellectual, but Paul Ryan. Uh, actually cites Ayn Rand as his greatest influence and says that she's the person that influenced him the most. Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, he actually sponsored a whole bunch of billboards uh, with the phrase, who is John Galt, and information about promoting Ayn Rand. Um, and, uh, you know, Alan Greenspan, uh, I'll, I'll go on to the next one, Alan Greenspan, who was her close protege, was friends with her until she died, and actually used to go to jazz clubs with her here in New York City until she died in 1982. Uh, Alan Greenspan, you know, he, he gets a job in the White House, and that picture on the last page is, is when he got his first job uh, after the removal of, of Richard Nixon. When he got his first job in the White House with Gerald Ford, uh, Ayn Rand actually went to the White House with Alan Greenspan to be sworn in uh, at, at, at the White House. Now, uh, Alan Greenspan eventually becomes the director of the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, the Council on Foreign Relations is the most important and powerful think tank in the United States. It's basically the brain of the CIA. It's where uh, U.S. foreign policy is thought of, basically. It's a lot of academics, and they, they are paid by, uh, by ExxonMobil and uh, the Ford Foundation and a lot of very, very wealthy think tanks to come up with foreign policy. So he's the director of it from 1982 to 1988. And then he becomes the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board from 1987 to 2006. Um, and he pushed for deregulation of lending. Uh, the idea was the government should not interfere in how people lend money, just let them lend how they want. Um, and he's actually been, a, a Time Magazine and a number of other publications have listed him as considered to be most responsible for the 2008 financial crash. And he actually admitted as much before Congress. Uh, this is his testimony from October 23, 2008. He says, I made the mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such they'd be capable of protecting their own shareholders and the equity of firms. So, he's asked, you found that your view of the world, your ideology was not right and that it was not working? And he says, that's precisely the reason I was shocked, because it's been going so well for 40 years with considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. So he basically admits that his philosophy that he, he gave his life to was, was very much responsible for the financial crash. Um, it's also worth noting that he was very much an advocate of removing Glass-Steagall. Um, and he thought that Glass-Steagall, this idea that, you know, that commercial banks and financial banks should be separate, he didn't believe in that, you know, that was government interference, banks should be able to do whatever they want. That's Alan Greenspan, he's probably one of the most powerful people in the United States, you know, in, from, from the 80s up until, you know, the, the early 2000s. Um, and it's worth noting that he was the personal friend and protege of this philosopher Ayn Rand who, who believed compassion and empathy were great human flaws and defects. But we should talk about uh, Milton Friedman. Now Milton Friedman, he's also an economist. 
Um, his parents, uh, you know, they were immigrants from Hungary. He owned a, 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 what his, he admits was a sweatshop that his parents owned in New Jersey where people were kind of being worked very hard, paid very little. Uh, he was an advisor to Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater ran for president. Against it was against Richard Nixon in the primary, but then against uh, uh, LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, and he runs against him, uh, and he's portrayed as just kind of being very extreme and right wing, and he loses to Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is pushing the Great Society, and we need a bigger welfare state. Barry Goldwater is saying we need to cut. There's too much government spending, and people are lazy and need to get a job. And and Milton Friedman is his economic advisor. Um, Barry Goldwater loses the campaign. However, he then reemerges to be the campaign advisor of Richard Nixon when Richard Nixon runs for president. And this is in the middle of the turmoil in the 1960s. Richard Nixon is running on the, he says he's the law and order candidate um, and that he's going to restore law and order and that he speaks for the silent majority that don't approve of the civil rights movement, don't approve of the anti war protests that are taking place. So Richard Nixon takes office and Milton Friedman is his top economic advisor. And he, you know, is pushing, you know, Nixon to deregulate and, you know, they start having huge amounts of inflation and you have a big economic downturn. So then Nixon expels Milton Friedman from the White House. And that's the famous quote from Richard Nixon. He says, we're all Keynesians now. We all buy into the idea the government should spend on the economy. We, you know, Milton Friedman's philosophy that we should just privatize everything and have total free market, he doesn't buy it. So. Milton Friedman's kicked out of the White House. Um, and there's actually, interestingly, National Review Magazine, which is a very conservative magazine, says, well, it makes sense that Richard Nixon would kick Milton Friedman out because really the only way Milton Friedman's ideas could really be applied was with some kind of dictatorship, with some kind of you know, totalitarian regime because you know, people just, you know, if you cut government spending the way he wants to do, people just won't go along with it. So uh, you know, Friedman's at the University of Chicago, Chicago School Economics, that refers to you know, him, and he's getting funding from the Ford Foundation and from the Rockefeller family in particular, and he's been kicked out of the White House. Um, now it's also important to note that, um, that you know, after he was removed, that's when you know, the Rockefeller family and a lot of forces started funding protests against Richard Nixon as well, and, and, and saying that Richard Nixon was becoming a dictator and that he needed to be removed from office around the same time. So it's, it's interesting to note. So that ends section Two. Do we want to go around again? I guess we started over here last time. Let's start here. Okay. Mr. Mopin, can you really th say that Alan Greenspan completely repudiated his entire philosophy just based on a small, out of context quotation in congressional testimony on October 23rd, 2008? Well, I mean, that wasn't really a, a complete. Not at all. Repudiation of his entire life. Philosophy. And in fact, he wrote uh, just recently, just about a, a, a couple of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, he wrote their Weekend Review article basically arguing for what he'd argued for his entire life, which he passingly says was responsible for the financial crisis, arguing that we need to repeal Dodd-Frank, that we need to we need to cut spending very drastically. He's he's, he's touring around making the same arguments he's made his whole life these days. Uh -huh. um, yeah, you know, but that's, so that pass, so that's a passive admission, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it wasn't a repudiate. It wasn't a complete total repudiate because he's still espousing these ideas. Right. Even though he, he kind There's of admits. a brief admits, moment of doubt. Uh, for a brief moment, he admits, yeah, it had a role in crashing our whole economy, but he's still going around promoting these ideas. The uh, part about uh, Barry Goldwater is sort of interesting. I was wondering, because uh, it came up during the 2016 election that Hillary Clinton was a supporter of Barry Goldwater. I wonder if you knew like a little more information on that. I, don't, I just heard about it. don't know much about it. Well, he lost in 1964. He lost the presidential election. Um, and, you know, that's the famous campaign advertisement uh, with, uh, you know, with the girl counting the daisies and then there's an atomic explosion. Um, his slogan was, in your heart, you know he's right. And then the response was, in your heart, you know he will, like he will push the button. And Barry Goldwater was portrayed as like this extreme anti-communist fanatic who was going to get in there and get rid of every social program and also lead us into World War III with the Soviet Union. And Lyndon Johnson was portraying himself as somebody who was much more sensible and you know was not going to escalate the Vietnam War, which of course he did. Um, and, and the other thing is that uh, the loss of Barry Goldwater is why the Republican Party eventually started to purge some of the more extreme McCarthyists. Like the, the conference for uh, the, the Conservative Political Action Conference removed the John Birch Society, and they were not welcome there. 
at that point. John Birch Society was this group that believed that Dwight Eisenhower was a communist and that our drinking water was infected with communist mind control drugs and all of that. And they started kicking out some of the more fanatical far-right elements from the Republican Party because they felt like they had alienated the U.S. public and that, that Barry Goldwater's loss in the 1964 election was a result of that. Um, and Barry Goldwater was, was very opposed to the civil rights movement um, and you know Lyndon Johnson also had ads where he had like the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and he loves Barry Goldwater and that was considered you know I mean that was a moment where the Republicans were losing and it was you know in the aftermath of the you know the assassination of John F. Kennedy and there was there was still you know that Kennedy spirit this idea that you know that, that the, the, the way to defeat the Soviet Union was to be more was to be more democratic and be more true to our ideals and be more liberal and that that would show that the Soviet Union wasn't right in the way it demonized the United States. It was kind of the height of what you might call Cold War liberalism, I would say. And Barry Goldwater went down in flames and lost. And Milton Friedman was you know was arguing we needed to privatize everything and total free market and, and it, it, it didn't go over. Um, the question, however, was about young Hillary Clinton, who, yes, yeah, she was the head of the college Republicans, and then she, shortly thereafter, was like a, a, a young attorney, a legal student at Yale and defending the Black Panthers. So she had quite a quick uh, oscillation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Any, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, um, I heard um, in regards to Ayn Rand that, you know, in the era of when uh, studies and science was starting to come out about the harmful effects of cigarettes and she was an avid smoker um, how upset she would get over it I guess kind of an ego thing you know she always wanted to look like what she was doing was right so um, she would make a big show of handing out cigarettes to like especially her young followers and um, would just insist on like how you know, those are just lies and exaggerations trying to impede on, you know, your human right to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and, um, but then also I heard, like, wasn't it towards the end of her life um, when she did get cancer from smoking that she went on, she used her husband's last name and the, the medical costs, like taxpayer funded medical costs in today's money is over like a million dollars. I didn't know that much. Yeah, for like all of her like cancer treatments and everything. I know that she did argue that the, uh, that, that the belief that cigarettes cause cancer was a was a Marxist distortion to hurt the free market. Um, I had heard that. I hadn't heard that other stuff. I have heard that she did collect Social Security, and people have said that that's you know a level of hypocrisy there. And, um, but yeah, I, I never heard that, 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 that thing. I know it's also it's not confirmed, but it was rumored that she told her followers that Sputnik was uh, was not real. Sputnik was fake news, and that, that clearly the Soviet Union could never possibly go to outer space. That was just fake news. Everyone knows that in socialism, it's just not possible, and that she believed it would be repudiated. But that's not completely confirmed. And so, and there's a lot of things about her that aren't completely confirmed. One thing about her that I think is interesting is when she died, um, her, her casket at the funeral had next to it a topiary of a dollar sign. Wow. Instead of a, you know, instead of, you know, you might have a cross or something. They had a big topiary of a dollar sign. She, she wore a brooch. A lot of injuries. She's, wore, she's wearing a brooch with a dollar sign. And that, that always struck me as like, really like, obnoxious. Quiet. Yeah, obnoxious. Just price tag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> price tag? What? What did he say? Price tag. Oh, price tag. Another thing about Ayn Rand, a lot of people in pop culture say Ayn Rand, but she always says, she always said it's Ayn rhymes with swine. <laughs> so that's a great mnemonic device. Yeah, that, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. There's actually, there was a mini-series that Milton Friedman did for American tele television called Free to Choose. It was on PBS, which, that's a level of hypocrisy there because, right? Public you know, broadcasting. Public broadcasting paid for by tax dollars. But uh, people kind of make fun of this mini-series promoting free market ideas because at, at one point they had Ronald Reagan on there. And Ronald Reagan says that, uh, he says, you know, uh, Milton Friedman won a Nobel Peace Prize for economics. Well, there's no Nobel Peace Prize for economics. There's the Nobel Prize for economics, you know, but, but that, that, that was, people were kind of laughing about that. Um, but anyone else got a, another point or do we want to go on to the next section? I guess we can go on to the next section. Let me apologize. Lots of statistics. Lots of statistics in this section. All right. So September 11th, 1973, the CIA worked with Augusto Pinochet, who was a general in Chile, to overthrow Salvador Allende, who was the elected president, who was a Marxist. Um, 
you know, the military seized the government, uh, rounded up 20,000 communists and socialists and de detained them in the National Sports Stadium, torturing lots of them, killing them. Just a, a really horrendous episode. And still, to this day, I mean, it's had a huge impact on, on Chile, uh, which I'll, I'll get into later. But, you know, it was, it was a big dramatic event when you saw the Chilean government just violently overthrown with the help of the CIA and instead, you know, replaced with Augusto Pinochet, who is declaring himself a military dictator. Um, now, Milton Friedman, who was at that point at the University of Chicago with his Chicago School of Economics, they called them the Chicago Boys, they were flown to Chile to be the economic advisors. So immediately, Friedman is there, and he's working with Pinochet. They cut all government spending except the military by 10%. They legalized forms of financial speculation that had not been legal before. They lifted all price controls, and that was very important because at that point in Chile, the price of food was very closely regulated. Um, there were, there were a lot heavy price controls on food. He allowed unlimited foreign imports, no tariffs, nothing, you know, total, total free trade. Um, and then he had a policy of killing labor union activists and leftists, so, you know, there were not many strikes and protests going on because you, you got killed or disappeared. Uh, one thing they would do is they would dump the bodies of people who'd been killed, uh, leftists who'd been disappeared, in the streets. Um, there's a lot of pictures of dead bodies of leftists. You know, someone would be known to be a communist or whatever, and then their body would show up in the street a couple weeks later, you know, just as kind of a message like, you know, don't be a communist, don't be a leftist. Um, you know, the other thing is that, and there was a huge underground Marxist movement, like people would talk about, like they would, uh, you know, they would, on the roof of buildings, they would have stacks of leaflets, like tied with string, and they would like light a candle and then run away, and then the, you know, when the, when the candle burned, the, the paper would, paper would break, and then the leaflets would scatter and fall from the building, and people would collect it. And there was a widespread underground resistance to, uh, to the Pinochet government. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal. Um, if you were a leftist or a Marxist, you were killed. That was pretty much their policy. Um, and the result was 20 to 30 percent unemployment. Um, they laid off the government workers in, in big numbers. Uh, and also you had, you know, all these domestic companies now were competing with products coming in from all over the world. So they went out of business. Um, you had 117,000 industrial jobs eliminated. But more importantly, and this is really the one of the most shocking things about Pinochet's government in Chile, is the price of food skyrocketed. The average family was spending roughly 74% of their income on food. Can you imagine 74% of your income on food? Like, what do you have left for rent? Um, the average calorie intake dropped to less than 1,200 calories. Uh, now, the school milk program, that was one of the Yende's programs, is they were giving kids milk in school, right? Well, they eliminated it. And there was widespread instances of children fainting in school from lack of food. And there was a lot of children who just dropped out of school because they couldn't, they couldn't be in school. And there was a huge, huge epidemic of homeless children. Um, that became a big thing. Um, now, the Organization for, of the American States actually commissioned a study because there was so much child malnutrition going on in Chile at this time that they wanted to see what the effects were. And they were actually able to document that if children don't eat properly, they will lose their motor skills and they will not be able to walk, um, and that they will become permanently mentally disabled. And there are a number of people in Chile to this day who were malnourished as children during the aftermath of the Pinochet coup, and as a result, they are mentally disabled. Um, the other thing is that, you know, when the economy, the overall economy is in this bad of a state, an underground economy emerges. So the drug trade escalated and child prostitution escalated in big numbers, right? People have to find a way to survive and if the economy, the, the real economy collapses, an underground economy emerges. Now, interestingly, advocates of neoliberalism will often say that there was a Chilean economic miracle and that it was just this economic miracle and that he saved Chile and it was so amazing Milton Friedman went in there and he saved Chile. That's not the case. Um, you know, Pinochet took power in 1973, September 11, 1973. Uh, the result, mass unemployment, mass malnutrition, 375% inflation. Then, you know, things continued to get worse. You know, you had between 20 and 30 percent employment until the 1982 financial crash, right? And that they speculated markets, He'd legalized all this, you know, all this speculation and the stock markets. They ultimately crashed in 1982. And at that point, uh, Pinochet was tired of listening to Milton Friedman because clearly the economy wasn't going too well. And the Pinochet government began changing its policies. They renationalized some industries, and they began trying to stabilize the economy. The stabilization and the growth, uh, you know, that, that people describe as the Chilean economic miracle 
didn't really come about until 1988. So this is a long time after Milton Friedman's in Chile. Um, and even then, poverty remains at 45%. So yes, the GDP is rising by the mid-80s, things are stabilizing, corporations are making profits, but you still have a huge rate of poverty. And still today, you have a lot of poverty in Chile. Uh, the, the middle class that had been created in the, in the 50s and 60s was, was largely decimated. It's still there to some extent. Um, uh, it's actually interesting, the National Association of Manufacturers, which is not a liberal organization, those are not you know, socialists or communists, those are you know, pretty, pretty right-wing free market folks. Uh, the president of it, uh, he said that, that what happened in Chile under Milton Friedman was one of the greatest failures of economic history. Right? Um, so this, this, this idea that Chile is an economic miracle, it just doesn't pan out. Now, one thing, I'll throw this in there, is that, um, that you know, when Milton Friedman was confronted about the fact that he worked with this brutal military dictatorship, his response was, well, eventually Pinochet was overthrown, and that proves that capitalism leads to democracy. Right? And so I had to do what I did in order to, you know, and, and that free markets eventually create democracy. So, you know, it's, that, that, that was his argument. And actually, Pinochet was removed by a widespread mass democratic uprising, protests, people in the streets fighting back, and the people leading it, surprisingly, were the underground socialists and communists in a lot of cases. So, um, but after the coup in Chile, um, you had, you know, the populist leader Isabel Perón. In Argentina, she was removed by a coup by her military. They brought in Chicago School Economists. The military dictatorship in Brazil also started following. Uruguay followed them. And that was kind of widespread. It started out in the Southern Cone with Chile and then Argentina. And it started spreading all throughout Latin America in the 1980s. Um, now, you get an individual in 1985 named Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University. And he's a little bit different than Milton Friedman. Now, Jeffrey Sachs. He is from Columbia University, and in 1985, you know, Bolivia has an election, and you know, he moves in and he becomes an advisor to the new government. And they're able to carry out a lot of the similar policies, where they privatize things very quickly, and by 1987, they're having 25% to 30% unemployment, mass layoffs, wages go down by 40%, the number of people with jobs with retirement pensions goes down by 61%, so they're getting rid of the pensions of people who, who were working eventually in 1995, the Bolivian president auctions off the state industries at a hotel and it's kind of like a carnival atmosphere and he's selling off, he's selling off the oil and the railways and the phone companies and, and um, you know, the price of water goes up by 300%. But what's different about Jeffrey Sachs is Jeffrey Sachs was able to carry out Pinochet style economic reforms without a big brutal military dictatorship. There was no war in Bolivia, there was no you know, military junta seizing power. He's able to carry out Pinochetism without Pinochet, right? And so that's why he's widely praised. And, you know, the, you know, the, the, the economy does start to improve. The GDP is going up, poverty is increasing, wages are going down, but people are making profits. It's not a huge economic disaster. So Jeffrey Sachs, you know, he's, he's kind of the superstar of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and he becomes kind of the superstar. And he hangs out more with liberals, like, you know, the Democratic Party. He's not, he's not an extreme right-winger. He's more considered a, a liberal. And he makes friends with a Hungarian billionaire by the name of George Soros. Uh, people have heard of George Soros. Now, George Soros is a Hungarian billionaire, and one of the main things George Soros did was he funded protest movements in Eastern Europe against communist governments. Uh, you know, the Solidarity Movement in Poland, a group of workers who were striking to the Roman Catholic dock workers didn't like the, the communist government. Well, they're being funded by Soros. Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia, uh, various anti-communist artists in the Soviet Union. Soros is, you know, paying them. Soros is a liberal. I mean, he's very liberal-minded, uh, but, you know, he doesn't like communism. And he's working with the U.S. CIA to help kind of coordinate these protests all over Eastern Europe to help bring down the Marxist governments. And we know the Soviet Union fell. Um, in the fall of the Soviet Union, and he's, he's paying a lot of these protests and, and supporting them. And he's a friend of Jeffrey Sachs, and he actually pays for Jeffrey Sachs' travel across Europe. Uh, whenever Jeffrey Sachs, as communist governments are falling, Jeffrey Sachs comes in, and his airline tickets are paid for by George Soros. And interestingly, in the mid-90s, George Soros actually starts to question. He doesn't believe in free markets and neoliberalism anymore. He starts to say, well, he's for more of a Keynesian model, and he backs away from all of this after he'd been the main sponsor of, of Jeffrey Sachs throughout the, the early 90s. Um, and so then in 1993 in Russia, you have the constitutional crisis. The Soviet Union has fallen. They have their first election in Russia, and they elect a communist majority to the parliament. 
and uh, the, the, the Communist majority, it's Yuganov, the Communist Party, the Russian Federation, they're trying to stop Boris Yeltsin from implementing free market reforms, from selling off state industries, from privatizing things. So uh, at that point, Yeltsin then uses his power in the Constitution to dissolve the parliament, right? And to just say, nope. So, you know, the communists who are elected to the parliament say, well, we're not going to leave. So at that point, uh, you know, people pour out into the streets. There's a big mobilization of people to defend the parliament. The military is sent in to clear the parliament. 187 people are killed. Um, it's, just, it's just a mess, right? The constitutional crisis of 1993 in Russia. Um, and now you would think, and I, I wanted to throw this in there, you would think that while something like this was happening in the former Soviet Union, while you know, elected socialists and communists are being kicked out and are defending their right to be in the parliament, you would think that <clears throat> Marxists, especially all over the Western world, would be out in the streets supporting their comrades, right? That didn't happen. Um, in fact, all over the, the Western left, this memo got sent out that because the Communist Party of the Russian Federation was aligning with a lot of Slavic nationalists and right-wingers that this was a, quote, red-brown alliance. And they were saying this is a fascist gathering, this is a red-brown alliance. And there was actually, there was very little solidarity. There were a couple protests in support of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, but very little. And this, this, there was a saying that if you, you know, that this feeling among Western leftists that if you go out and support, support the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, you're supporting anti-Semitism, you're supporting fascism, you're supporting Russian nationalism. You, and, and there was very, very, very little solidarity with the Communist Party of the Russian Federation during the constitutional crisis in 1993. And so, of course, Jeffrey Sachs comes in, he's the advisor to Boris Yeltsin. So he comes in, privatization, selling off state assets. 80% of Russian farms go bankrupt. Uh, 70,000 state factories close down. And what's interesting is a lot of these state factories, you know, they're sold and, you know, Western companies buy them, American companies buy them, and just shut them down. And what, what's that about? Well, because if they're producing, they're, they're in competition. Right? And at this point, you know, as the farms are going bankrupt, as the factories are going bankrupt, Russia starts importing huge amounts of products and food, especially from the United States. So the farms are going bankrupt and all that. So they're, they're buying American food. They're buying American products. You know, in 1989, before the fall of the Soviet Union, there were around 2 million people in the country that were in poverty. Uh, by 1996, that number is 72 million. A 70 million, incre million people go into poverty. One in four Russians are living in poverty at that point. 37 million are living in conditions described as desperately poor. Uh, the number of drug users, this is according to the Russian uh, Ministry of Drugs, uh, increases by 900%, right? Uh, the suicide rate doubles. Um, and overall, they lose 10% of their population. Now, it's not just people dying, it's also people just fleeing the country uh, and, and moving somewhere else. And economist Andre Gunder Frank calls it economic genocide, uh, you know. And actually, and this quote, I actually was in the room when he said it because he was speaking at NYU. Uh, Bill Bradley, the former senator, he was there and he was going over there with the Clinton administration. And he said, 30% unemployment, rampant inflation, pensions gone, savings gone, 30 or 40 years, it's all gone. No jobs. A few people doing very well who bought all the assets from the state, but the average person, no. That's how he described, this is U.S. Senator Bill Bradley, how he described what was going on there in the 1990s. But it's not just, you know, it's not just Russia, it's all the former socialist countries. And a couple examples, in 1994, in the Ukrainian city of Lviv, you have running water and electricity for only a few hours, in the morning and the evening, because they have so little money, they, can, they can't afford to keep the lights on, they can't afford to keep the, the water running. Um, the average life expectancy in Russia goes down by about three years during this time. Uh, a 50 percent increase in the price of food in the city of Prague uh, in 1989 to 1990. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, during the time of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was prevented from importing a lot of Western products, right? Like bananas and, you know, Coca-Cola and all of that. And people, you know, they tell stories about people in the Soviet Union. They would keep like a little Coke can and it was like a, a treasure. This is, you know, the glorious West. I've got my little treasure here. But now, all over Eastern Europe, you can buy Coke and you can buy, uh, you can buy bananas and you can buy all these products. Uh, well, I mean, they're on the store, they're on the shelf in the store, but people can't afford to buy them. You know, I mean, people don't have the money and people are fleeing in big numbers. Uh, there was a huge rise in human trafficking, sex trafficking during this time. Uh, you know, heroin is all over there. It's just a disastrous time for, for Eastern Europe as they're implementing all these free market reforms. Also in the 1990s, you have the rise of, you know, what you might call globalist institutions. Um, the World Trade Organization is found. So this is, the World Trade Organization is, is a trade, you know, trade deal that essentially the economic laws that you pass in your country are subject to review 
by the World Trade Organization. So there's you know a group of people appointed by corporations. And if you pass, if you want to raise the minimum wage in your country, or if you want to regulate spending or whatever, you have to go to the World Trade Organization, <coughs> and they can approve or disapprove of it and fine your country um, if, you, if you do it in a way they don't approve of. Um, the International Criminal Court is set up in 2002, something Soros really campaigned hard for. They've so far indicted 39 people. Uh, every single one of them is African. Um, um, among them are a number of the leaders of, of the, uh, the Libyan government of Muammar Gaddafi that have been indicted. Every single one of them is, has been indicted. And the International Criminal Court is set up in the aftermath of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Um, and it's set up in which they're, you know, after the destruction of, of Yugoslavia, they're, they're bringing in all the leaders of the, the former socialist government there and charging them. Interestingly, now, the UN Charter is adjusted to include the phrase responsibility to protect. Uh, the UN Charter allowed no you know, no, no violations of the sovereignty of any country. But advocates of neoliberalism work very, very hard, including Samantha Power and others, to get added to the UN Charter this phrase, responsibility to protect, where if people's lives are in danger, it's okay to infringe on the sovereignty of the country, right? Libya, that's a sovereign country, but, you know, they said Gaddafi was killing people, so NATO was allowed to go and bomb the country and overthrow the government. Uh, Serbia was the first example of responsibility to protect being implemented, but it's been used all around the world. Humanitarian intervention is now allowed according to the UN Charter uh, under, under this, this change. Um, and we've had our share of neoliberalism here in the United States. Um, there's the Taft-Hartley Law, for example, that was passed in the aftermath of the Second World War, 1948. Um, solidarity strikes. If you're in a workplace and you want to go on strike, by law, it must be about something in your workplace. You can't have a solidarity strike if, uh, with, with people in other workplaces. It used to be to be unionized, they had what they called card check, which is that, you know, yeah, if, if half the people, 51% of the company, people working there agreed to be represented by a union, the union represented them. Not anymore. Now they have the National Labor Relations Board process where it can take up to two years and, and it's a long process. Um, this also, interestingly, allows the president, the Taft-Hartley Law, to, uh, to order striking workers back to work for a cooling off period. So there's a strike at a company, it's, an, it's extreme, so he says, you know what, the president can just say, well, you all have to go back to work for up to two years for, for a cooling off period. We're going to let things cool off, right? Basically, allows the president to prevent stri strikes. Um, it's a very, very anti-labor law, and there's been a lot of talk of repealing it. Uh, there was proposals. Obama said he was going to pass what he called uh, the Employee Free Choice Act, which was going to repeal the Taft-Hartley Law. He seemed to have forgotten about that as soon as he took office. Uh, uh, you know, but we also have you know, private prisons and military contractors and charter schools. Um, and you know, this is a big point that Milton Friedman really pushes in his book, Free to Choose, and his miniseries. Why have the government do something? Because a private corporation can always do it better, right? So why, you know, when we have prisons, right, when criminals get arrested and put in prisons, you know, why, why have them be run by the government? Why not have a private company that gets paid, you know, money to lock people in jail? What could possibly go wrong with that, right? Or schools, right? You have education. Well, you know, well, schools aren't good. Why don't we set up schools for profit where private companies get paid per student to send people to schools? Or, you know, we send the army to go out and fight our wars. Why don't we have these private companies that get guns and weapons and send people into conflict zones, right? Um, and one example of, of this privatization uh, is, you know, the Metropolitan Transit Authority. A lot of people think the subways in New York are government. They're not. The MTA is a public beneficent corporation. Banks make profits of it. And, and you see kind of the, the rise of, you know, people like to talk about crony capitalism, where things are private, but the government is facilitating a monopoly. So private companies are set up that make profits for corporations and for investors, but the government is facilitating it. And that seems to be almost a staple of neoliberalism. It's different than classical liberalism, which is the government does nothing. It's things that are done by the government are handed over to private corporations to make profits off of them. Um, you have the deregulation of lending um, and you know, the famous housing bubble, 2007, 2008, where it suddenly became legal. All kinds of lending practices that have been completely illegal were being legalized in the lead up to the financial crisis, where you know you could you could take a mortgage on your house and it would be a certain amount for two, three years, and then it, the the payment would be triple that, you know, all of a sudden. And of course, people lost their homes in big numbers. Um, student loans, for example, most industrialized countries allow you know the government provides education. In the USA, the government facilitates the lending of money for people to get into student debt for the rest of their lives to pay for their education. So that's neoliberalism in the United States. And I just wanted to throw this in there. You know, advocates of neoliberalism will often talk about how they believe in freedom, right? They believe people should be totally free to do whatever they want, government hands off. Well, take a look at some of these memes you can find on the internet. 
right? They love Augusto Pinochet, and uh, they think it's very funny that during his the aftermath of his coup, he had a policy of, uh, you know, I guess not a policy, but some of his, his supporters were taking leftists and communists and throwing them out of airplanes uh, and helicopters, right? And so it's become like this big joke, uh, you know, and you can see this is quite popular among advocates of neoliberalism. So, you know, these folks believe in freedom. It seems like, you know, what they want to do to people that disagree with them is a little bit different than uh, just allowing them to have their free speech. So on that note, that ends section three. So do we want to go around? Go ahead. Um, so I'm curious about the case of Pinochet because that uh, it was really interesting to me about him then going back on policies that he had put in. Like, I mean, you could call it like a puppet regime of him being installed, and I've just never heard of that before. You know, someone who was installed as part of a puppet state then going back on their orders essentially and becoming more, you know, a little humanitarian, I don't know how to well, call it. How has it changed? I mean, how was he allowed to do that well, at I, that point? I think he felt that it was necessary to change the policy because things were getting so bad, there was a danger that there could be some kind of uprising, especially in the aftermath of the financial fallout of 1982. Even a lot of the people who supported him when he came to power had lost all their money um, at that point, and it became necessary for him to stay in power to, to make some reforms. I'm not saying he became a humanitarian or some great, you know, you know, liberal, caring guy, but it was at that point it was necessary for the Chilean government to take action to prevent things from getting worse. Um, there might have happened internationally somewhere a trial of the U.S. for what it did in Chile, but um, just from the beginning, sort of um, freshly imagined, what would be if we had magic wands? I mean, the U.S. should be tried and punished for what we did in Chile, and Absolutely. the public is still in the dark. So that's where we're at as a people. Um, I guess uh, one thing I thought was kind of interesting, um, like I think these examples of private prisons, uh, for example, yeah, private prisons, I guess, particularly, um, like I think, I think a, part of, a lot of neoliberals would say that that's uh, Kind of a, a failing and like the whole military yeah. like industrial complex right uh and like the ba basically because it's like you know once you privatize it then you've got like a lobby that like wants more prisoners right um i guess i, I think maybe maybe some a, a lot of neoliberals would to say that that's like a failing like a poor execution of their own policy rather than at the heart of the policy itself um and I, I mean, because I, I think uh, that can be a tendency, right, for like uh, people to say like this is the exception to the rule, uh, and then the people on the other side say like this is the direct result of the rule. Um, you know, like some people are equal, some but what, some people are more equal than others is like like what uh, they might say, pointing to the other thing. Whereas you would probably say that's like poor execution of socialism, right? Well, it's interesting because, you know, Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan and a couple other people wrote a book called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And they argued that no society in all human history has ever really been capitalist. They've all been socialist to one degree or other, and that true capitalism is this unachievable ideal. And that argument is very widespread. Um, for example, uh, I know, I believe the son of Milton Friedman calls himself an anarcho-capitalist. And he argues that you don't need a government. You can have capitalism without any government whatsoever. Um, and that the response you'll get, um, I'm very, you know, when you argue with people who agree with Milton Friedman, they'll often argue that all these things we're talking about, well, that's not really, really libertarianism. That's not really neoliberalism because the government had some role. Somehow this was crony capitalism. And that, that argument shows up and that you get this vision that, well, it's, it's, it's an unknown, unachievable, it's this, this utopia where the government does absolutely nothing and everyone is their own corporation, is their own small business. And, and that, that belief system certainly persists. And I think a lot of younger people that get into these ideas don't even, they don't even bother to try and look into this stuff. They might post a helicopter meme or something. But as far as they see it, their vision of libertarianism or true capitalism is so so much more extreme than what we're seeing here in these experiments. And that's what that's what Milton Friedman called Chile. It was his laboratory. I mean, he was conducting an experiment. It looks to me like the experiment failed. But then he went on to conduct the experiment in Argentina, and then he went on to conduct the experiment in Bolivia, and and so on. But 
but yeah, I mean that's that's generally the response you'll get is that's that's crony, and that's been my, my response. People say, well, that's crony capitalism. Where have we seen any capitalism that's not been crony capitalism? I mean, if if you had a huge amount of money, would you not you know try to make sure that the government functioned in a way that would allow you to keep that huge amount of money? You know, and and there's this belief that 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 you know in true capitalism the government will just not cross certain lines. It will just it will only protect property. And, and I, we've just never seen that anywhere. Um, but that is, that is this, the, the libertarian argument. That's very, very common. Um, but then I've noticed, though, that you know, none of them, you know, Pinochet is defended and defended, and then you start to point out the actual results, and then all of a sudden, then it's crony cap. You, you understand what I'm saying? It, it's, the position changes based on how the argument goes. But, but oh. Yes, um, going back to the, um, the UN Charter to, um, to include responsibility to protect, um, there are actually some legitimate um, like criticisms of Gaddafi's rule, uh, especially during their later years. We actually did, um, he actually was um, in fact behind some of the you, um, human rights violations and many of his people, uh, the people there did not like him. And and I was just wondering like, is there like an alternative like to, uh, instead of like a military intervention, like to fund like, um, like, not, not, like a non-government, you know, uh, movement to fund like resistance groups, you know, to overthrow, you know, um, a dictator without, um, without having to uh, interfere or um, violate uh, the, <clears throat> violate the, um, the, um, the, the sanctions, I mean, the, uh, what's that word I'm saying? Sovereignty. Sovereignty, yeah, without violating the sovereignty of the nation. Is there an alternative? Well, well look, look, I guess Sandra wanted to say something. No, I'll let you respond to that. Well, I mean, I, I mean, that's what Soros does. I mean, he funds these protest movements around the world, and you know, governments that are unfriendly to Wall Street and, and London. They, they, you know, these protest movements. The classic example being Otpor, uh, which was in in Serbia uh, to bring down Milosevic. Um, and uh, you know, but if you look at it compared to, you know, throughout that region, the the Gaddafi government was very very advanced. They had the highest standard of living. They had built the world's largest irrigation system. Uh, in, in terms of women's rights, they were very, very far ahead. Um, and they, they had done a huge amount to raise the country out of poverty. And if you look, for example, at, um, at, uh, at Nigeria, which is now, it used to be Libya was the top oil producing and exporting country on the African continent. Now Nigeria is. And if you compare the conditions that people live in in Nigeria in terms of life expectancy, in terms of education and all that, it's nowhere near what Gaddafi had achieved in Libya. And that the Gaddafi government, the Islamic Socialist Jamara, am I saying Jeremy Jamara? Jeremy Jamara. All right, right. I mean, if you read it, I mean, it was it was very effective in terms of raising people up out of poverty and all that. And did they have the level of human rights that we have here in the United States? I'm sure they didn't. You know, nowhere near it. But nowhere in the developing world has that because you know that freedom is based on a level of economic development. You know, and when people are in extreme states of poverty. Uh, when, you know, I mean, the, the, the level of freedom decreases and that freedom is the ability to be free is based on a level of stability and economic abundance. And I think that there was huge efforts to try and develop Libya and bring it to the point. And interestingly, Saif uh, Gaddafi, the son of Gaddafi, was actually one of the one of the biggest advocates for opening up. Um, and, and for example, uh, he said that he had no interest in becoming president after Gaddafi died. He said because the country is not a farm to be inherited. And he was constantly calling for more uh, more openness and more dialogue with student dissident groups and, and that there was a huge effort by the Gaddafi government to have dialogue with the dissident dissident activists and the people that were opposing Gaddafi and there was an attempt to negotiate you know do you want I mean it was they very much wanted to not have a huge civil war and if you look at the conditions in Libya it's a disaster now I mean things are so bad I mean this, this, this slave trade there's slavery there at this point uh, people are getting on rafts every day and trying to flee in the Mediterranean to get out of there I mean Libya has just been just been destroyed overwhelmingly and the other thing that, that gets left out about Libya is that in a, a lot of the objection to Gaddafi was not about human rights among the urban youth in the cities it was but a, a lot of the fighters were objecting because they felt Gaddafi was not a true Muslim they felt that Gaddafi, he had a girlfriend who was not a Muslim, and that, that the main, one of the main fighting forces in the revolution was actually uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were arguing that Gaddafi was too secular and not a pure Muslim. And actually, the Manchester bombing, uh, the guy who carried out the Manchester bombing, had been in Libya fighting against Gaddafi. 
and then came back and carried out the Manchester bombing, uh, the horrendous bombing at the concert. Uh, you know, and that, that a lot of the, and a lot of the forces that were in Libya trying to overthrow Gaddafi were not Libyans. They were Islamic extremists from other parts of the Middle East who had gone there. And then after the overthrow of Gaddafi, they then went to Syria, and now they're in Syria trying to overthrow Bashar Assad. Um, I was impressed <coughs> with um, Gaddafi's <coughs> efforts to create a democracy in Libya. If you read his little green book. It's quite inventive in improving upon our sham democracy. We really don't have a democracy. We have uh, voting games with districting all over the place. But um, he does set up in his plan for government that every citizen group has discussions. There is flow of choice information all the way up the channel. He does provide, really, a government of foreign by the people. Uh, one nice example is, um, uh, he, he's, instead of jobs, he pushes for partnerships. And I think that is a flaw in America, that um, taking orders for living is inconsistent with a healthy manhood. Mm. If you read the, uh, the, the, the Green Book, he talks about these things called popular committees that, yeah. that, he, that were formed with the basis of the government. Um, and it's very similar to like the Soviets and the Soviet Union or the committees to defend the revolution in Cuba or the Bolivarian circles in, in Venezuela and other Bolivarian countries. Um, and what's also interesting is that, you know, the Green Book was, you know, it, it was a, at one point, I think these laws were changed during the 1990s, but at one point it was illegal to make profits from housing, it was illegal to make profits from food, um, and there was basically state control over most almost everything in, in Libya, but it was paid for by oil. I mean, that was the thing. They were selling oil on the international markets, and with the profits, they were, they were kind of laying the basis for it. And Gaddafi did not call himself a Marxist. He rejected Marxism. Uh, and he argued that Marxism was about factory workers and, and the proletariat and all that. And he said that, that actually, he said that, that Libya, you know, we're more of a Bedouin and, a, and an agrarian culture, so why would we, why would we, so, you know, but it's interesting, Gaddafi was aligned with the Soviet Union. He was a funder of the Black Panther Party in the United States. He was a funder of the IRA in Ireland. He was a funder of all kinds of, uh, you know, groups that were fighting for national liberation and, and things like that around the world. Um, you know, Gaddafi was certainly interesting. And I want to say during that war, the biggest rally that I went to against the bombing of Libya was in Harlem. And it was the Millions March in Harlem called by the Nation of Islam. And there were tens of thousands of people there protesting against it. And many of them felt that if Obama had not been president, the war in Libya wouldn't have happened. Um, that, that it took a black president to carry that out because Gaddafi was so loved. And the other thing that gets raised a lot is that Gaddafi was apparently talking about creating an independent African currency at the time. Uh, um, and that, that, that many people believe that, that played a role. And I believe many people have pointed out that, that if you look at Hillary Clinton's emails, uh, that she almost admits that that was a, a factor in, in why they wanted to overthrow him. Um, but we should, we should talk about other things than just Gaddafi. Cause maybe, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Sandy, you want to make your point? Yeah, in the 1993 constitutional crisis in Russia, you talked about the American left uh, acting like it had its head up its ass, and I'm shocked, shocked to hear such an allegation. You want to just give us any more details on that? Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's at the time, there was all this talk of the Red-Brown Alliance in Russia, right. and, uh, you know, you, you couldn't support, you know, the people in Russia and standing up to neoliberalism and cuts because, you know, then you were supporting Nazis, you were supporting fascists. Right. That was the allegation. And how could any Russian nationalist be a Nazi? You know, with all of what Hitler had done to the people. Of, you know, I mean, it's like think Possible. about it. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I don't understand that myself. But, but are, do you have any amusing anecdotes of ultra leftism? I wasn't. I was very young at the time. I wasn't politically active in 1993. Right. I guess so, not. I so I guess I don't. Uh, but you, you notice it? Oh, okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I think it's uh, really telling. You know about what was going on in Russia in the 90s um, with Yeltsin, and it's often talked about in the mainstream media how Yeltsin was the first democratic uh, leader of Russia, and uh, Putin, of course, he's an authoritarian, he ruined it, but, um, and then uh, Pinochet, uh, you know, who's a U.S. ally, and Margaret Thatcher uh, made a comment about how he, uh, something along the lines of how he brought democracy to Chile, or saved democracy, something like that. But it, it's just very telling because, you know, obviously all of the mass killings of Pinochet and authoritarianism and uh, the authoritarianism of Yeltsin uh, sending tanks to open fire on the parliament building in Russia. These people, uh, by the uh, 
global uh, imperialist order are considered uh, democratic, while Gaddafi is someone who establishes a government through the popular committees, uh, the Jamhiriya government, is considered a dictator. It's just amazing how when they have control of the, uh, the media and all the uh, information apparatus, they can make reality the exact opposite of what it is. So, shall we go on to the next section? Or does anyone want to make a comment before we do that? All right. We'll go on to the next section. So this is on resistance to neoliberalism, which I think is pretty much the defining, the defining aspect of the period that we're living in. I think neoliberalism was defining things in the 1990s, but we're living in the, the aftermath. We're living in the period of resistance to neoliberalism. At this point, the IMF is even saying that they were too neoliberal and they made mistakes. Um, so, and, all right, so in 1989, uh, in Venezuela, the, uh, the price of public transportation vastly increased. Uh, and as a result, you had a huge uprising called the Caracazo. Uh, people went out the streets and it was a re rebellion. Um, and then Hugo Chavez, who was a paratrooper and was kind of a polit political figure and a military leader, tried to seize power in a military coup after this, this uprising had taken place. It didn't work, he was put in prison. He was released from prison. After he was released from prison, he formed a political party called a Movement for the Fifth Republic. Um, and at the time, the Movement for the Fifth Republic said they didn't believe in either capitalism or socialism. They were for what they called the Third Way, which would be what was best for Venezuela. Um, so then, uh, 1999, Chavez took power, and he used the military to help the population in the aftermath of some mudslides. And that was unprecedented in Venezuela's history. The military had never been mobilized to protect the public, um, and that was big. He was able to pass a new constitution, uh, the Bolivarian Constitution of Venezuela. Uh, and then in 2002, there was an attempted military coup against him, but he was popular among the rank and file soldiers, and so they rose up and brought him back to power, and the coup was defeated. Uh, 2003, then Chavez announced that he no longer believed in the third way. He said that he wanted to build what he called 21st century socialism in Venezuela. So. In 1998, Venezuela had only 12 public universities, now it has 32. Uh, free health care is provided to citizens in clinics that are staffed by Cuban doctors. They made the arrangement, they gave Cuba oil in exchange for Cuba sending doctors. Uh, the population gets free heating and cooking gas. They actually wiped out adult illiteracy by bringing in Cuban teachers. That's one of Cuba, you know, it sends these literature, literacy volunteers around the world. So with Cuban literacy programs, they've wiped out adult illiteracy. Uh, poverty has gone down since 1995 by about 50%. Um, and they have a program where people are able to buy homes uh, with interest-free loans. And I actually, I walked through a neighborhood in central Caracas, and I remember they told me, they said every single one of these houses was built on an interest-free loan provided by the, the government. Uh, cheap public transportation, all of this paid for by state control of the oil. The government oil is used to pay for a huge, huge increase. Now, obviously, as people know, more recently, Venezuela has been having some problems. These problems started in 2014 when the oil prices dropped. We had the lowest oil prices in recent history. It was something like uh, $27 a barrel. It was under $30 a barrel. You could actually buy a uh, family meal at Kentucky Fried Chicken for less than, uh, for more than a barrel of oil cost. So the, the oil prices had dropped very, very significantly. The government economy was centered around oil. Um, and so you had some big problems. This was also in the aftermath of the death of Hugo Chavez when there were political divisions within the party. Um, now, and interestingly though, whenever you talk about Venezuela, no one wants to acknowledge that they were having decent rates of growth and, and significant increases and reduction of poverty prior to the 2014 oil price drop. But the Wall Street Journal admits this freely. Uh, this is you know, a quote from the Wall Street Journal. When I arrived in Venezuela in 2013, the party was still on. Oil was fetching $100 a barrel, and Mr. Maduro's popular government was showering petrodollars on everyone. The Caracas skyline was dotted with grandiose construction projects. Steakhouses were loaded with, uh, were buying vintage scotch by the container load, and hotels had to be reserved for weeks in advance. That's what was happening in Venezuela up until you know 2014 when you had the oil price drop. So it doesn't sound like people were starving and dying. And this narrative that people in, in Venezuela were starving and dying the entire time, and that's because of socialism, that's just not factual, right? The problems that happen now, which are greatly exaggerated in the media, the UN has actually confirmed it's not a humanitarian crisis there. There are problems, but there's not a humanitarian crisis. But, but this notion that, that all of these problems are all caused by socialism, the moment they became socialist, all these problems happened, that's simply just not the case. Um, and it's interesting that that narrative 
gets constantly repeated in the media. Socialism caused the crisis. Well, they've been moving towards socialism since 2002. They've had Chavez, they had Chavez in power since 1999. So why did the problem start in 2014 if socialism itself is the problem? Um, but it's not just Venezuela. For example, in the government of Nicaragua, uh, which you know is not an oil-based economy, right? Uh, they've had significant growth with the Bolivarian government. The Sandinistas, uh, they took power in 2006. They had, you know, they'd been defeated. They originally came to power in 1979 in the revolution. They had lost the elections in the early 90s. They were voted back into power in 2006 uh, on the slogan "Christianity, Socialism, and Solidarity." They reduced poverty by 30 percent. The GDP has risen by 36%, and they're, they're working very closely with China to build a $40 billion canal project that would be an alternative to the Panama Canal, um, you know, because Nicaragua is also there in Central America. And that way, the United States would not have the ability to block the Panama Canal in some kind of emergency situation, which is one thing that the U.S. holds over China. In fact, that's why China is very anxious to keep control of the South China Sea, because China depends on oil imports. If, if China doesn't get oil, the lights go off. You know, I mean, it's, it's their industrial huge apparatus of production is dependent on oil imports. So there's a huge effort to, to make sure that they are able to keep, you know, the, the oil tankers flowing. And so they're actually building this canal in Nicaragua. And actually, it's run by, I, I wanted to note this, the World Happiness Index of the United Nations is a project of Jeffrey Sachs. And Jeffrey Sachs admits that in 2016, the country with the highest increase in happiness in the world was Nicaragua. So even Jeffrey Sachs is admitting that they've had their successes. Uh, and one of the things they've done in Nicaragua, interestingly, is a lot of the things at the top of the economy are government-owned, but the government has helped a lot of people in Nicaragua to start their own businesses. And they've, they've you know, loaned people and, and helped a lot of Nicaraguans to start their own businesses. And there's been land reform and other policies. Um, so that's interesting. But the other government that is very much a reaction to neoliberalism is Vladimir Putin's government in Russia. Right? Vladimir Putin was a PhD student when he was in the, in the 1990s, and he wrote his college dissertation on the concept of national champions, which are big corporations controlled by the government that are used to stimulate an economy. And he wrote his college thesis about this. He got elected in 1999. And then, you know, from then until about 2006, he went about creating Gazprom and Rosneft. And these are two gigantic state-controlled corporations. One is an oil company and the other is a natural gas company. Um, and these are huge corporations and they generate huge amounts of revenue and that revenue has been used to get the Russian economy back in order from the disaster of the 1990s. At this point, Gazprom is 17% of the world's natural gas production. 18% of the world's natural gas reserves, and it's been used to build up an economy in Russia. Poverty has been reduced by 14%. Uh, the GDP has well more than doubled. And John Brown, the CEO of uh, British Petroleum, he says that no country has ever come such, so far in such a short space of time, and that compared to how things were in the 1990s when Jeffrey Sachs was there, you know, advising Yeltsin, Yeltsin on how to loot the country and privatize it, things in Russia have vastly, vastly improved under under Vladimir Putin. Um, it's also interesting to note they have a flat tax in Russia. Um, the, the tax is about, I believe, 13 to 14 percent. No more than that. Everyone pays about the same amount. Um, and just like Nicaragua, you know, the state-controlled energy corporations and industries have been used to help small businesses. There's a lot of small businesses in Russia stimulated, a lot of them subsidized by the state. I think that's very interesting. Um, now, Putin is deeply influenced by Deng Xiaoping theory in the Chinese Communist Party. There's actually a picture there of Putin meeting with Deng Xiaoping's daughter. And according to Philip Fair, the author of the book Europe Since 1989, Putin's advisors actually began consciously trying to study Deng Xiaoping theory um, and the, the theories of Deng Xiaoping about how to have a state-controlled economy with a market sector. I think that's very interesting. But I also wanted to mention there's a, there's a political theorist who's very popular in Russia right now named Alexander Dugan. Um, he's a political scientist. He was a founder of the Russian Communist Party. Uh, eventually, he started another organization called the National Bolshevik Party. Now, he currently leads what's called the Eurasian Movement. And he wrote a book in 2009 called The Fourth Political Theory. And this book was widely circulated around the world. And it basically argued that liberalism, what he calls liberalism, which is he defines that as the Western ideology that says individualism takes precedence above all else, that's the source of the problems in the world. He calls that the first political theory. He says communism was the second political theory. It failed to defeat liberalism. Fascism was the third political theory. That failed to defeat liberalism. And he argues that emerging in the world now is what he calls the fourth political theory, which is an attempt to, uh, a, a, another attempt to challenge Western liberalism, which he sees as the source of problems in the world. And, and he's a very, very, very well-known Russian political thinker. Uh, uh, you know, so I just wanted to throw that in there. 
Now, I also wanted to mention, I, I didn't want to get too much into China, but President Xi Jinping, uh, he was elected president in China in 2012. Um, he was made a core leader of the Communist Party in 2016. And many see his presidency and his leadership as, a, as an effort to roll back the influence of neoliberal ideology in China. Uh, you know, the Ford Foundation was funding a lot of think tanks in China. There's something called the Institute for Socialism with Chinese Characteristics. And a lot of, you know, a lot of efforts to promote free market ideology in China. And President Xi has really rolled that back. And he's actually, one of the things he's famously said is that we need to carry on the enduring spirit of Mao Zedong thought. Um, and he's been emphasizing the Communist Party's ideology. Like, for example, it was pointed out that at a lot of the big universities, you know, every, every, every you know, university student in China is required to study Marxism. But in some of these Marxism classes, they were watching George Orwell's uh, 1984 movies and things to that effect. And that, that he's actually been really pushing the, the communist foundations of the Chinese Communist Party very hard and kind of re-emphasizing that. And of course, the Western media is now calling him a dictator. But he's also, he's also leading a huge crackdown on corruption. Um, and that's a big problem. And he's you know, started to enforce the Communist Party's rules about taking bribes um, and, and things to that effect. So that's, that's quite interesting. The most important thing that President Xi has done is he's launched the One Belt, One Road initiative. And basically, all over the developing world, China is building infrastructure. Um, you know, it's kind of the opposite of what the IMF and the World Bank have been doing. The IMF and the World Bank, they go into a country and they, they demand that they cut government spending you know, deregulate, you know, stop funding infrastructure, stop, you know, hiring government employees. China does the opposite. It lends money to governments to build bridges and highways and airports and essential infrastructure. And this has the effect of then stimulating the domestic economy. And the domestic economy gets stronger, and then China is, has more of a domestic economy to trade with, and they call it win-win cooperation. And uh, China has actually asked the United States to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment <coughs> Bank and join the Belt and Road Initiative. The United States has refused to do that. Um, however, reaction to neoliberalism, you also have what's called the New Right, which is emerging in Europe and the USA. Uh, Donald Trump, Steve Bannon in the USA, Nigel Farage, and UKIP in the United Kingdom, Alternative for Germany. And you, you know these folks are labeled populists. And they oppose, they, they rant against what they call globalism. They're very opposed to immigration. Uh, they're less favorable to military interventions. Um, and they denounce they, George Soros, they don't, they don't like George Soros, and they're against the international trade deals. But they believe in neoliberalism, just neoliberalism in one country. And, you know, yeah, yeah um, they, they're all about privatizations, they're all about cuts in public spending, they're all about free market policies. They just don't like it on a global scale, they want it on a domestic scale. Um, and I think as some of the global institutions are starting to back away from some of the more extreme neoliberal policies, they find that as a threat, like that some of these smaller businesses are going to be forced to adjust to some, some more liberal policies. And there's, a, there's clearly a division, but these folks, you know, they're not opposed to the ideology behind neoliberalism. They totally believe in privatizations and cuts and deregulation. Um, and oddly, they equate globalism and the, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and the International Criminal Court and George Soros with communism and socialism, which is, I don't understand how that makes any sense. But, you know, in, in their mind, I guess, Maybe because Karl Marx believed in workers of the world unite or, or was opposed to nationalism. I don't, I don't quite understand that logic, but somehow global capitalism is socialism. So, And that brings me to leftism in Western countries. Uh, you know, it's noted that in a lot of left-wing circles, there is kind of a, an emphasis on cultural and gender issues and a kind of a reluctance to talk about economics. Um, often, you'll see leftists in the Western world denounce these countries that are fighting neoliberalism, like Russia, China, Venezuela, and others, in the name of anti-Stalinism or in the name of human rights. And often, you see the organized political left in the United States centered in universities. Um, and often, not, you know, surprisingly or not surprisingly, a lot of the leftist thinking is actually funded by the very forces that were pushing neoliberalism around the world, like the Rockefeller think tanks, the Ford Foundation, and George Soros' Open Society Institute, among others. There's a lot of these foundations. And a lot of the left-wing thought in the United States is funded by these very institutions. Um, and populism. Populism was originally a leftist concept. The idea of you know, organizing the people to go and fight for their rights and raise their standard of living against injustice. You know, it was very left-wing, but now there's this belief that, that, uh, that populism is problematic. That when you get people to be populist, that's inherently fascist, or that's inherently racist. And that uh, the focus needs to be on educating the ignorant rabble about gender theory and privilege and postmodernism. And, and so that's kind of an interesting shift in leftism. And that often we see leftists in the Western world playing the role not of promoting socialism or communism, but rather of playing the role of protecting the establishment from opposition that is labeled to be fascist. Essentially, at this point, we see the left playing the role of protecting 
the, the status quo from the new right, essentially. Um, however, the question is, can that be changed? Because there is a long history in the United States of left-wing populism. Eugene Debs, uh, the, you know, William Z. Foster in the Communist Party of the United States, the role the Black Panthers once played, you know. Um, and a majority of millennials tend to have a favorable view of socialism at this point. Bernie Sanders was extremely popular. There's internet culture. All over the internet there are young people that are not just, you know, not just interested in socialism. Mm -hmm. There's internet tankies, people admiring, you know, Stalin and things to that effect. Um, so the organization Students and Youth for a New America, which some members of it are here, um, has openly talked about building kind of a patriotic left that will be an alternative to, uh, to, to some of the prevailing thinking of the anti-racist, anti-imperialist, socialist alternative to the decaying and ineffective Western left. And the Center for Political Innovation, which sponsored this presentation tonight, seeks to facilitate discussion of developing a new anti-capitalist theory and practice for the current political crisis in the United States. And at the end, one of the slogans we've been using, uh, uh, we need a government of action to fight for working families. And that's a very famous painting from the 1930s of a woman uh, you know, as part of the unemployment councils being arrested as she's protesting, demanding, uh, demanding food and, and housing and things to that effect. And you know, those protests are what got us social security and unemployment insurance to begin with. Um, so that's, that's the presentation. So let's discuss. Um, I'm, I'm going to reiterate that it is important for um, like this new wave of alternative communists that, that we're trying to bring up to, to very much support feminism and gender equality and even you know support defending trans people. But what happens uh, in, in the current um, spectrum of the American left is that it, get, it got taken over by the Democratic Party, and there's a lot of you know uh, Democrats and pseudo left or center right that say that they're left the, um, that. You know, see it's at its profitable what they say rainbow capitalism, and a lot of them, uh, and a lot of them don't even want to. It's not that they, I guess, the higher ups. I wouldn't say the higher ups really care about actually defending the rights of the LGBTQ community, but I really think it's just about profits for them, um, because and also you, they also don't talk about the economics. They don't talk about social economics whatsoever. They, they may dabble in universal health care, or they may dabble in you know uh, low income housing, but they never actually talk about you know. Um, utilizing industries and, and seizing it for the people. It's very, it's, it's almost like a watered-down version of leftism. If you could even call it leftism, I would call it social democracy. But, um, yeah, it's very important that while, while we should support and defend, um, you know, gender issues and the LGBTQ community, we also have to equally put a lot of focus on the economic standpoint heavily. Um, and we need to talk about it more because I do not hear a lot of, I, like, a lot of leftists talk about the economic pro, pro, um, aspect amongst themselves, but when they, if they do try to recruit people to their, um, recruit people to socialism, uh, they don't really talk about the economics or what the actual, and you don't even have to go, I'm not talking about, like, uh, dividends and, like, very complicated, um, like, numbers, I'm just saying, like, socialism lowers tax nationalization, uh, universal employment, um, you know, stuff like basic things. I'm not saying you have to look up Soviet planners who were five-year plans in the 30s, but just like very basic stuff. That's, what else want to talk about? Anything? Yeah. yeah. To go back to your first point that you made about the term limits, um, you know, some people might say that removing term limits like what happened in China under Xi Jinping is dictatorial, but they would also have to have a big problem with Angela Merkel. They'd have to have a big problem with Theresa May and Tony Blair, and because most oh, right. most of these countries don't have term limits. Australia doesn't. All these countries don't. But for some reason, it's big news if China does it. Um, you know, and to, like when talking about like a free media or anything like that. Currently, right now in Argentina, a couple months ago, there was. Well, right now, they're hosting the G20, and there's terrible repression against. <clears throat> there's terrible repression against protesters in Argentina right now. Um, people have have disappeared under the current regime of the country. Um, and in Argentina, they've also disrupted transmissions of Russia today. You know, but again, I don't hear very much discussion surrounding this. Um, and again, it's there's this talk of corruption that a lot of people like to talk of when they talk about anti-imperialist leaders. Like, the former president of Argentina, for example. Right now there's a gold rush in Patagonia because people are looking for the supposed 
millions of dollars that Christina Kirshner embezzled, they didn't find anything. You know, this is a common narrative. They've done it against Rafael Correa. They've done it against Lula. They've done it against Christina. You know, it's called lawfare. You know, they're trying to present these charges, and much as they say, you know, people who might say that Putin is the richest person on earth, you know, they did the same thing to Gaddafi. They said he was a billionaire, and none of it ever seems to check out. Well, I, let me add to what you said that I think, you know, China in particular, if you read their statements, uh, they are very adamant that they know that they have problems with human rights, and they're trying to carry out reform and trying to get beyond that. And I think most developing countries will tell you that they have serious concerns and they need to do it. But, you know, human rights is based on a level of stability. And if, you know, if countries are deeply poor and, you know, you know, you have to have, no one in the world spoke about human rights until the 1400s. And was that, were people just evil until then and they just didn't have this revelation you should have human rights? No, it's because a level of economic development had, had occurred that at that point you could begin to talk about the rights of the individual. You know, try running a subsistence farming, uh, you know, or even you know, most of human history was hunter-gatherer civilization. Um, you know, try, try running a hunter-gatherer tribe on that level of subsistence with everyone just being allowed to do whatever they feel like doing. It wouldn't work. You know, and that, that, that abundance lays the basis. Development and abundance lays the basis for more of an opening up. But you really want to say something, I'm sorry. Yes, um, also under uh, Xi, um, uh, Xi Jinping, um, um, ever since um, his election, um, uh, China also, um, it's actually kind of uh, contradictory in uh, China because China almost kind of runs as a state capitalist system. For instance, they have a lot of, you know, uh, sweatsh um, you know, there are a lot, most of our products are made in China and they don't, and many of their workers are underpaid, starved, and they're even like, um, many of them have attempted suicide to the point where they had to create barricades for them to prevent from being, um, for committing suicide. And there's also one, um, and there's also, um, the, the social credit where they don't if you don't if you have a, a bad social credit you're not allowed to travel outside of Beijing or anywhere and uh, from outside of China and there's also the the facial scanners that they're employ and um, implementing and that it might uh, but I also to me that sounds like a violation of human privacy not I'm not talking about like private like violation of privatization but humans you know um, <clears throat> you know privacy of human of human individuals. Certainly, room for criticism of any system. Yes, I, I, I would. Uh, but, and I don't want this to be like where we just sit here and defend every. You know, what I mean, like yeah, I was just we, we want to talk overall. I think. Yeah. But but, um, but does anyone else want to say anything, or do you want to just continue? I, I was just gonna like say one quick thing. Like we're just um, like I have a lot of prisons of, of China and, and, and Russia, especially. But like like we're just talking about their economics and like what they do economically. But like if you want to, but for as far as their social um, laws go, like social credit system. Or other censorship that would be never, ever, ever be implemented in the U.S. If the U.S. were to have a, a socialist um, government, because that's just not what our values. We're not China. Anybody who says they want to like export a, a specific kind of socialism from another country, that's just not Marxist or scientific. Um, but we're just like talking about the economic aspect mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. 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 Taking seven hundred million people out of poverty is you know, really good for human rights, and that'd be nice if we had that problem. You know. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to bring up my disagreement, which was a um, question of the new right. And uh, I think it's not so simple as to make these different groupings. And, and in fact, that is what I, I mentioned this new right and Woods thing before. There's, and there is an attempt right now to, to put these two camps, the new left and the new right, the new global progressive thing. And Joe Biden just wrote this thing about it. And, uh, Bernie Sanders is, you know, on the list of this of this new Bretton Woods Keynesian proposal for a new global credit system, which is a global bank, ICU, you know, this is Keynes's policy, and a global currency. <coughs> uh, and they're trying to put, you know, uh, Lopez Obrador into the mix and say this is our new global resistance to the right wing, you know, takeover of all these European governments and Trump's part of it. And I just think it's not quite. I don't want to get stuck in like the problem of just defending everything Trump does. I certainly disagree with many things, but uh, I don't think that it's so simple um, that he's just a neoliberalist. He ha he did talk about protectionism. He did, um, McKinley, you know, he's done this multiple times. He's attacked, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, private, public-private partnerships for infrastructure. He said they don't work. 
Um, so I think it just sounds so simple. He's kind of a grab bag. I mean, I don't think he's so easy to pin into one of these things. He is for money, sure, you know, he's, you know, fall into the capitalist mentality and some of these problems, but I just think it's not quite so simple. So I just don't want to get, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, He's like a bona, he's one of the Bonapartists, essentially. How do you mean? He's like, uh, well, he's he he isn't. I, don't, I wouldn't say he is a Bonapartist, but he uh, he gives off that vibe of wanting to be a kind of Bonapartist type figure, if you know what I'm saying by Bonapartism. Mm -hmm. uh, well, basically, I mean, you could probably explain this more if you want. So. But um, but but uh, Louis Bonaparte. A lot of people think Bonapartism was named after Napoleon. It's not true. It's his nephew. Louis Bonaparte, who came to power, where basically when there's like two big sections of the capitalist class that are fighting against each other for similar interests, um, there's a strong man that takes over and suppresses one group of capitalists for the interests of another group that's con and fighting them. And I think Trump is some kind of manifestation of the current um, conflict with uh, the capitalist class right now. I'm not too much of an expert on who he represents, because um, but I believe that he is he does represent a group of capitalists against a, another group. Um, and that he is a weird wild card. I mean, he just, he didn't come from, he didn't really come from any old rich family. He came from his father. They're from Germany, so he doesn't really, he didn't really belong to the old American capitalist lineage. He's kind of, his family is, like, is in terms of American, money. yeah, his, in terms, exactly, in terms of American <clears throat> capitalist families, he's kind of, uh, they're kind of new. So that's why he's a wild card. He does things that people don't, but you could well, say more if you want. I don't know. I think you're right, Rachel. And a lot of what he said on the campaign trail was not neoliberalism. He said he was going to build infrastructure. Right. He, he even at one point alluded to something about doing, you know, canceling student debt or something to that effect. He said he, I think he said he was going to restore Glass-Steagall at one point, you know. And so, you know, he, he said a lot of things, but I feel like so far the policies economically have been tax cuts on the rich, deregulation of the environment, you know, I, I just... I, I think what Joe is saying has a lot of truth in it, especially because it, it's interesting, like uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, who is the, uh, the head of the uh, Department of Education, um, you know, she's quite wealthy, but where does her money come from? Amway. Oh. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, think about how like the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the DuPonts feel about having somebody working in government who, you know, made their money from, you know, selling Tupperware, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, that, 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 and you know, you, you look at it, it's almost like there are, there are some families with entrenched power in the United States, you know, Duponts, Carnegies, Morgans, and and Waltons. The, yeah, Waltons, and and they yes. kind of run the show. Yeah, yeah. I and, and and Trump probably represents a section of the rich and powerful that feel like they've been locked out and feel like you know the, that that the government has been working for these specific interests and has not been working on their behalf. And it seems to be a division. You know, I mean, if you look at it. You know, there's almost like a division. I, I almost feel like the richest of the rich are very, you know, are, are open to government involvement in the economy because why not, right? They want to keep what they've got. And if there's going to be a government monopoly, they'll get it, right? It'll be them who gets it, right? And they can afford to, you know, it's like, you know, tax me more like Warren Buffett or whatever. And I feel like it's the lower levels of the rich that want to completely deregulate things. And they really do believe that if you just privatize everything, the country will turn into a paradise. And, and you know, they got rich, so why can't everyone else? And, you know, and th th this, this, this division, you know, I, I think this division is playing out. The other thing is that I feel like Trump's coalition is very, very um, fluid. I feel like there are some forces that were with him at the beginning that are now not with him. Um, and there are forces that are now with him that were not with him at the beginning, and that, that that's also kind of interesting. Um, and and you know, I mean, if you just look at, at the way things in the White House seem very erratic, I get the idea that behind the scenes, you know, it's not really clear what the you know what the Trump revolution was supposed to achieve. It, it made you know so many clear promises uh, that were so contradictory that, that now we're seeing things play out. Um, so. But yeah, I mean, there were a lot of there were some good things Trump certainly said. There were a lot of bad things that I disagree with. There were a lot of really good things he did say on the campaign trail. Uh, I, I won't disagree with that. You know. All right. All right. So I get you know like um, a lot of us you know are you know socially to the left, and this is about um, you know economics. I get that. But I also think we should be focusing on environmental justice as well, because without a clean environment or you know um, <clears throat> or um, innovations, you know, to actually uh, protect the earth, you know, while we can, then we won't be able to fight for economic justice. Yeah, I wanted to just add something to that. Um, this actually was a thought that I had in one of the first sections. Um, there are a lot of uh, sort of environmentalist kind of people 
uh, environmentalist uh, liberals in a way, who are falling into Malthusian ideas about overpopulation, and that's going to be a major problem. Uh, not overpopulation, but the idea that it's going to be uh, yeah. the, supposedly the center of our problem when it's not. Uh, and climate change is, you know, not just on the horizon, but it's here. Um, we have a lot to deal with, a lot to work work on. And if we don't have a real socialist alternative, I think uh, it's going to be kind of a dangerous future. Right. And I I would say that the answer to environmental problems is advancing technology and is having control of the economy so we can operate in a sustainable way. In China, they talk a lot about sustainable development. Um, and that, that Malthusian thinking in, in environmentalism, I think, is a big problem. The issue isn't that we have too many useless eaters and too many people. The issue is that our economy is managed in a way that different capitalists are trying to make profits for themselves in a rather irrational way. Um, and uh, and, and the, you know, that kind of thinking in environmental circles does deeply concern me. I think global warming, I don't reject it. I think it's definitely, you know, climate change is a serious problem. We have to address it. But I don't think we can address it with a free market economy. I think we need, we need, we need a rationally planned economy to address what's a big issue. And if every capitalist is just trying to make money for themselves, <coughs> we're not, we're not going to be able to resolve it. Um, and, and, and I guess it does. The other thing is that I feel like, you know, with the, you know, there are some forces. I, I would say that some of the big oil companies see environmentalism as a way to make the rules so that no one can compete with them. You know, and that, uh, that you know, there, there was, uh, you know, some forces that felt like the, uh, the, the climate treaty was in some ways rigged to benefit Western countries and was about keeping developing countries from developing. And I mean, you know, that's, that's a concern. And th there's a lot that needs to be addressed here. I think Almost all the forces in the world now recognize there is an ecological problem. The question is, is the answer freezing human development? Do we all need to go back to the dark ages? Like some forces very openly argue. Or is the answer more technology, more, and, you know, and, and rational control over the means of production so we can advance and, and move ahead? That's, that's, that's the issue there. Uh, that's how I see it. Caleb, I enjoyed your presentation and your intellect is a gift to humanity, but uh, the last line here, the last question, the last section, you say, can a movement against neoliberalism be created in America? But I think you're sort of starting from scratch here, when really, I think this great group full of energetic, smart people could be a part of a larger mass movement that already exists, you know? Like, you know, we in the DSA, Joe and I, are very proud of the fact that the left is really winning now. AOC winning for U.S. Congress. Taleb in Michigan winning, you know, sending the, one of the first Amer um, uh, Islamic uh, American women to Congress. Uh, you know, two Native Americans being sent to Congress. Um, it, it's, it's amazing what's happening in this country. You know, so uh, there is a left. Or it, you know, Occupy Wall Street was huge. Um, yeah, I could go on and on. But I, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I think there's already a mass movement out there that we should, you know, consider ourselves to be a part of, and not we don't have to feel like we're we're like the new left, you know, that yeah. that we're like the total vanguard of it. But the thing is that um, you're right, and there is a huge interest in socialism, but the Democratic Party is holding back any progress whatsoever, and they go around gallivanting themselves as some progressive force when they're actually just part of the ruling class. Now, I'm not. Now, there are people who are trying to overthrow the corporate Democrats, just people like Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders, but there's, I mean, they're probably threatened. Bernie Sanders, who knows what they said to him to get him to back down. Um, I think the Democratic Party is like, you know, I, uh, this is on videotape. I think they're terrible, and I hate them. Oh. Well, I, I don't agree with you, Joe. I actually, I, I think that the, uh, the, the what's going on with Bernie Sanders is great. No, it is, What's yes. going on with Ocasio-Cortez yeah. yeah. is great. I think it's, it's amazing. Um, but I would really like, you know, straight up opposition to neoliberalism yeah. and straight up, you know, socialist ideology like built, you know, the Communist Party back in the day, like Eugene Debs exactly. had. I'd like that to be a part of what they're doing. That's right. all I have to right. say. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, socialism, let's talk about what socialism means, right? Nowadays, the neoliberal definition of socialism is whenever the government does anything, that's socialism. That's not the case. Right. Socialism is a society where the banks, factories, and industries, and the major centers of economic power are operated for the benefit of the people, not for the benefit of profits. And I feel like a lot of the younger people and older people, too, that are getting into socialism now, that's kind of been lost. It's kind of like we want, we want a Keynesian welfare state, you know? And I, I, that's better than what we have now. I'm for it, you know. But I think that actual socialism and, and the ideology that built the labor movement and all of that ought to be part of it. 
Um, and that's why I'm, I'm very excited about this. I think that the moment is full of potential. And, and no, I'm not negative on what's going on at all. Um, I just, I think that we need to, to take it to another level. Yeah, How's exactly. that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like, if you hate the Democratic Party, try uh, being in the Green Party for 10 years, you know? Because <laughs> it's like, you kind of realize that politics is the art of the possible. Right. And Bernie and AOC running inside the Democratic Party as socialists, as Democratic socialists, and winning, and Bernie Sanders holding, um, you know, uh, um, prominent elected office for as long as he has, has really kind of, you know, it's a, like a beacon for the left, you know. So the, the, the Democratic Party, think of it, I know that the corporate Democrats are evil and the warmongers and the yes. pro, pro Wall Street, pro, pro real estate, uh, and you're right, but you know what, don't get off on being right. You know, figure out how to use the, the platform of the Democratic Party because that's where we can actually win elections. I'm for doing that also. I'm Good. just like worried about, I'm just worried about the corporate Democratic Party. Democratic Party if you have to. <coughs> and the Republican Party while we're at it. Oh, oh <laughs> that, we know. I mean, is yeah, that possible right. these days? Classic, the Republican and, party classical yeah. Republicans. Yeah, right. I mean, the Republican Party began as a far left party. Back in the day, Abraham Lincoln and was endorsed by Karl Marx. There was a communist general in the Union Army, August Willick. You know, I mean, I, I'd be I'd be for infil infiltrating the Democrats, the Republicans, or any other party. I mean, it's about it's about moving forward and building a government of action that will fight for working families. I mean, that's that's what needs to be said. And I feel like that's the antidote to neoliberalism. The message of neoliberalism is that the government should have no role; it should not play any role. And I think no, that we need to get back to that basic populist understanding: the government should serve the people. Right? You know, you know, the Twilight Zone. Here's, a, here's a, an example of neoliberal thinking. The Twilight Zone tended to be a, a, a kind of a lefty show, but there's one episode. Have you ever seen the episode uh, To Serve Man? Yes. That is demented, but think about that, right? Right. So these aliens come to Earth, and they're feeding people, and they're, they're so nice and all that, and they're going to take them home to their own planet. And they have this book. It's called To Serve Man, To Serve Man, you know, and it's so nice. And so then these people are on the spaceship, and it's about to take off, and someone shouts, it's a cookbook, it's a cookbook. So, so if, any, if anyone's ever trying to give you a better life, if anyone's, you know, trying to provide health care and all that, it's a sinister plot to cannibalize you and eat you. That's Cold War anti-communism. That's like Alex Jones. Yeah, yeah, basically, right? <laughs> and, and, and that we just we, we need to live in this world of like suspicion and isolation. But but yeah. the the way this country was built, I mean the way that you know that the LaGuardia Airport was built, for example, I mean it was you know people coming together and fighting, you know, building the Roosevelt coalition that, that fought for economic justice. And so I think we need to get beyond uh, you know beyond it's a cookbook. I think we need a government that will serve the people, and I don't think it's going to eat us or kill us. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, on that though, I just want to ask uh, so. You guys, how many of you are in China? Okay. The Students and Youth for the New America? Two, three, four. So, four of us. Oh, all, all of you guys? Yeah. So, uh, just, I don't know, if you guys could just go off about like what you guys do and, uh, yeah, anything, yeah, what you stand for, oh. that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, and maybe DSA too, if you want to talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, we've done, we've done, um, we do, we put a lot of emphasis on community work and feeding people and clothing people. That's what's important. We don't really see a lot of that as much as it, it used to happen. Um, we're for, uh, we're, we're also for a version of what I call revolutionary patriotism, which is basically, uh, I forget his name, but there was a Trotskyist, there's a really good speech by an American Trotskyist, I'm not a Trotskyist, but that's about, there's two Americas. There's the America of the, um, the slave owner, the imperialist, the war profiteer. Um, but there's also the America of the slave abolitionist, the women suffragist, uh, and like the the labor organizers. That that United States is something that we should have some kind of revolutionary patriotism. Not I'm not saying like we should support like you know we don't have to go around waving the flag, but we we should have pride in the progressive forces that have really given us a lot of the things that we have today, like the weekend and the five day work week and the eight hour work day was really brought to us by like the <coughs> progressive and socialist forces. And we should have some kind of pride in that. We don't have, we can hate the US government um, and the crimes that they've done, but we don't, we can't hate everything about this country because there are things that, there are forces within this country that have done a lot of good, that have, that it was, that served as a reaction against that, all the evil that this country has done also, like a counterpart. So, uh, so I think, uh, so can you maybe like on a nitty gritty detail about you guys, do you like go into towns and like, like I don't know, kind of 
Maddie, for example, has done a free laundry day, and it was, yeah. it was a great step forward. But also, you know, there's been, I, I noticed that the organization is in a lot of solidarity. Like, Dakota has done a lot of work to support Venezuela in particular, and has been to Venezuela and been on Fox News to defend Venezuela. But you were going to say something, Nick? You know, I just wanted to add on to that. It's uh, the idea of uh, a, what you could call, a patriotic socialism. I think uh, the, the, the big point about that is that it's not about any kind of uh, you know, jingoism or any kind of, you know, yeah. uh, you know, the United States is the best country or anything like that. We are extremely anti-imperialist, anti-war. We want to study the experiences of all these countries and, you know, expose the truth about what's really going on against what the mainstream media lies about them. But if you're going to really build a socialist movement that could have any influence in this country, you have to really, you really do have to look at historical aspects of socialism or revolutionary politics from within the country because uh, no revolution has ever been imported or exported um, it's always been from the country itself and I mean and it does exist there is uh, you know we, we've had uh, Caleb has given talks on it and there's you know huge amounts of uh, revolutionary socialist communist uh, organizing uh, that had major influence in the poli overall politics of this country, so it's uh, it, it's it's totally necessary. And anyone that doesn't uh, acknowledge the necessity of that is not going to get anywhere in uh, building a socialist movement in, in, in this country. Yeah. I mean, everywhere that socialism has ever been implemented, it has been a socialism rooted in that particular country. You know, what what Mao did in China was very different than what the Soviet Union had done. Uh, what Fidel Castro did in Cuba was very, very different from what from what had been done before that. In you know, in Venezuela and in Latin America, they now have Bolivarianism after Simon Bolivar, the national liberator, right? In the Arab countries, they developed Baathism or Baathist Arab socialism. Baath means rebirth, and it was a socialist theory for the rebirth of the Arab people. Um, and that that this idea that a lot of these, you know, I, I say this with affection. You know, I love young socialist activists. I love you all. I, I, I say it with so much affection. But there's a lot of people, and none of them are here tonight, who I, I would say are almost, you know, there's there's LARPing, live action role play. They really like to put on the costume of, of some socialist country and go out there. And, and But this notion that we're ever going to import Albanian communism or Soviet communism or Chinese communism to the United States is really absurd. You know, it'll never happen. Right? The only type of socialism we're ever going to have in America is going to be an American socialism. In China, they talk about socialism with Chinese characteristics, and they're very adamant that, that system, the Chinese system is never coming to the United States. They have no desire to export it or spread it around the world. And I think that there's going to be a socialism with American characteristics. That's going to be the only hope for us getting beyond the nightmare that capitalism has created in the United States. And that, that rather than trying to uh, live action role play for some revolution in some other country and dress up in costumes and have fun or, or read a lot of books or just kind of go along with the mainstream and whatever is popular in the Democratic Party, but actually trying to develop some kind of American socialism, I think that's that points toward the way out of the crisis and the way out of neoliberalism. What hope do you guys see in like uh, DSA or sign in terms of like electoral politics? Well, he's a member. Some of us are members of DSA. Yeah, okay, so I think that yeah. wherever there is a progressive force, um, you should get involved with it just just to help like pro just to help things progress. I mean, I'm, I don't agree with like every people. In, there's all kinds of people in DSA. There's anarchists. There's there's Marxist Leninists. There's you probably a Posadist. Who knows? But the th the thing is that you know it's a it's a it's a large very very large group of leftists who want to change the the, the system that we have, and I think it's only going to grow. Um, I hear a lot of people are critical of DSA because they don't go around yelling about you know Lenin and Stalin, but you know it's a mass movement. I think it's very important. I think that it's. It's in the, especially in the United States, we shouldn't be picky. We should do whatever we can to, like, you know, just uh, implement progressive forces wherever we can. We are running out of time, so a couple more, but then we're we're running out of time. But uh, I mean, just a suggest, suggestion for everyone. Um, you know, uh, there are there are a lot of. Um, like simple ways, you know, to actually help the socialist movement by inviting not uh, by inviting someone who's homeless into your home and having them stay at your place uh, for any time they need, and and it doesn't have any and, you, and um, if you see someone like shivering or you know, are starving, invite them to your home and just uh, it's very it, a lot of these you know um, 
movement, a lot of um, solutions uh, can be small steps and they can be taken just by, you know, talk, just by um, cooking for someone or inviting someone to your home, even if they're complete strangers. And I think uh, a, a lot of um, what helps feel neoliberalism is this sort of danger as well, in my opinion. And can I also just come back, and since you asked about the DSA, one of the things that's the big takeaway for me uh, is how well organized DSA is, and how it's committed to being democratic, and it is democratic. You know, it's like there's not like one, like maximum leader. You know, and uh, 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 it's really horizontal. You know, it's like, um, and it's easy to get involved, and and uh, so yeah, I would urge you, anybody interested in DSA to check it out. So uh, two, two things. Um, one, uh, the the countries. Uh, so, well, so I'm not sure about Nicaragua. Uh, I honestly, you, I just know a lot about more of these things of it than I do. But the, um, uh, but I, I think if I were trying to argue against uh, like socialism as a success in Venezuela, I would say like and in Russia. Uh, I would say that it is reliant on this, uh, you know, natural resource, right, of, of oil, and um, so basically, I mean, while there was no collapse, like, due to socialism, uh, what you could say is that basically, um, like, this natural resource was propping up something that's ultimately unsustainable, um, and so, I mean, that, that would be a, the best argument I could come up with on the other side, so I'd like to give you a chance to respond to that. The other thing is, um, the uh, uh, so the the fact that like the current left doesn't talk about um, like focuses on social issues uh, and uh, we, I think it's a totally fair criticism, but uh, I think that's probably true on the right too, right? Like the the focus on the right is on uh, you know probably anti-immigration. I mean, I guess you know it was anti-abortion like previously, but. Um, and I guess uh, it, there's like this bike shed effect, right, where like people focus on the thing that is simpler to talk about uh, as opposed to the thing that's, uh, you know, maybe more important but more complicated. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and so I, I think that's there on both sides. Uh, it might, if, if I, it's a bit of a criticism, uh, but uh, you could argue that like saying, like, you know, mentioning uh, that, you know, like, Ayn Rand worship, worshipped this guy that strangled his wife is, like, a, a bit of a, like, the same um, flavor. Yeah. Well, um, as far as the first point you made, um, you know, Bolivia, um, <coughs> Evo Morales came in, movement towards socialism, it's a Bolivarian government, they haven't collapsed, um, and that's largely, I think that there is an understanding that what they might, what you might call petro-socialism, which is what, you know, Libya was prior to the overthrow of Gaddafi, what Venezuela, you know, is, and all of that, and what, I mean, I would argue that it's, that it's the, very similar to Russia's political model as well, they don't call it that, but, you know, that, 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 that is a problem, when you're dependent on, you know, natural resources, selling your natural resources on the international market, when you're dependent on that as your economy, that's, that's a weakness. Um, and uh, China has the opposite problem. They're dependent on imports of that, and they realize that. That's why they're pushing alternative energy like crazy um, in China. It's like They just passed a law there that every car, uh, one out of every ten cars that's produced domestically has to be an electric car. Um, you know, and do you think a law like that would ever be passed in the United States? I mean, it wouldn't happen, you know. And they're not only telling that to domestic car makers, they're telling it to car importers. If you import cars, one out of every ten cars that you produce, wherever you produce, must be an electric car. That's huge. It's a game changer. And now we're seeing on the stock market the metals that are used in the car and the electric car batteries are going through the roof. They're so valuable because people want to get them to make all these electric cars that China is forcing them to produce. That's very exciting. Um, uh, but the thing about, about social issues is, you know, at the, you know, I feel like there needs to be an understanding that, you know, I am never going to change anyone's <coughs> mind about abortion. I think abortion should be legal. I think it's a woman's right. But I am never, if there was somebody here who was pro, pro, uh, or what they call pro-life or anti-choice, I'm not going to convince them ever because it's a deeply held personal belief. But if I could get that person to understand that socialism would make their life better, I would happily be in a socialist group with them. You know what I mean? We would disagree about the issue of abortion, but we would together want to build a better America for working families, you know? And I feel like in the atmosphere in a lot of left-wing groups is that that's not the case. You know what I'm saying? And that there's this demand that people go along with a, a social agenda that they, they may not be comfortable with. And that's, 
That's, that's what I think the issue is. I think that people can be socially conservative and still understand that socialism would make their life better. And I, I feel like in a lot of left circles, there's this attempt to just write off anybody who co who's not part of this leftist bubble, you know, and that, that that is itself a big problem. And that, yeah, I want to talk about economics. What I think to be, to be rather interesting is outside of the Western world, um, there are a lot of people that are very right wing that are very socialist on economic issues. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting as well. And there used to be a right wing critique of capitalism. In fact, the right wing critique of capitalism long predates Marxism. The Catholic Church, as capitalism was beginning, was saying that this is sinful, this is a violation of their teachings. Uh, you know, and and that, that, that the fact that, that one can be critical of capitalism from the right. Um, and I think a lot of the developing countries that embraced Marxism during the 20th century, as much as they were embracing a very left-wing philosophy, a lot of their basis for doing it was very conservative and very nationalistic. And we're going to build a better country and we're going to defend our culture from this Western stuff that's coming here. And that, that, that left and right, you know, I define left as belief in social progress. After the French Revolution, uh, you know, they formed a national assembly that was elected, and the people that, that wanted to march into the future and, and, and build a new France were on the left, and the people that wanted to preserve the old feudal order, they sat on the right. And that's the origin of left and right. I'm left because I want to move forward, I want to build a better world, and, and so I'm on the left. But I feel like a lot of that, you know, a lot of this gets muddled up. Who's left? Who's right? Who's what? You know, it, it's all very, very confusing in the 21st century, I'll say. So, do we want to conclude on that? Yeah. All right, cool.